The next item of business is the final stage of the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill. I call on the Minister, Mrs Naomi Long, to move the final stage. Minister. I beg to move that the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill do now pass. Thank you. The final stage of the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill has been moved. The Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate, and I call upon the Minister for Justice to open the debate on the Bill. Minister. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I am delighted to present the final stage of this Bill to the Assembly today. Bringing forward this legislation to support victims of domestic abuse who are suffering non-physical abuse has been a key priority not only for me as Justice Minister, but also for the Justice Committee, for members right across this House, as well as former Justice Ministers. Today, as that pledge becomes a reality at this final stage, I find myself with some mixed emotions. I am, of course, immensely grateful to everyone who has worked hard to get us to this point. Passing the first major piece of justice legislation, in fact, the first major piece of legislation generally in this mandate, is an important and positive landmark for the Executive and the Assembly and for my own department. However, I am particularly delighted that it is with this important piece of legislation that we will achieve this landmark, given the impact that this bill, when set alongside our other work in this area, will have on victims and survivors of domestic abuse. Many of those who have suffered domestic abuse have found their voice in this process and used it to relay their own often harrowing experiences to me as Minister, to my officials and to the Justice Committee and to other members of this House both directly and through those voluntary and community sector representatives that provide vital support to them, and for that we are hugely grateful. Hearing from victims and from our voluntary sector partners has been key in shaping this legislation, not just over recent months, but over the many years during which they campaigned for change. But it is for those many years that I feel some considerable sorrow and regret today, Mr Deputy Speaker. I feel I must apologise to victims and survivors for it ought not to have taken so long to reach this point. Whilst I am glad that we have reached final reading, I am genuinely sorry that we did not do so back in 2018, when this could have been passed had the Assembly not collapsed in 2017. While this Assembly was suspended, the abuse that victims of domestic abuse face, the violence, torture, fear and psychological wounds inflicted by perpetrators was not suspended. Sadly, it continued unabated throughout that period, and we were not here where we needed to be to make the changes to the law which would have offered them protection and shelter from that abuse. That is what happens when politics does not work. When we talk about the cost of the failure of politics, we should remember that cost has too often been borne by people when they were at their most vulnerable. So while we are all rightly pleased that this bill will now pass quickly into law, we should be sobered and reflect upon the impact of that delay and redouble our efforts as parties and individuals to ensure that we work better together, consistently and persistently, for the good of those whom we represent, and not least among those the most vulnerable. In contrast, Mr Deputy Speaker, with the Assembly up and running only a year, and despite the fact that this has been a year unlike any other, filled with challenges none of us could ever have imagined, this bill will move from this place today and in a few weeks become a reality. A reality that will make a tangible difference where and when it is most needed. The bill creates a new domestic abuse offence in Northern Ireland that closes a gap in the law and ensures that protection is not limited to physically violent behaviour alone as at present. It sends a clear message that domestic abuse, in all its forms, both physical and non-physical, is wrong and will not be tolerated, not by our community and, crucially, not by the law. At the heart of the new offence is ensuring that as wide a range of abusive behaviours as possible can be captured. We want to ensure that there can be no escape from the law for those individuals who seek to abuse and terrorise those closest to them. 
The new offence will cover behaviour that is controlling or coercive, or that amounts to psychological, emotional or financial abuse of another person. Abusive behaviour may also include sexual abuse and technological or digital abuse. It will also capture patterns of two or more occasions of physical and or psychological abuse by a partner, ex-partner or close family member, and will also include behaviour that is physically violent, threatening or intimidating. Domestic abuse will also be recognised in other offences with the potential for increased sentencing. We are all too aware of the devastating impact that domestic abuse can have on a child and of the impact of adverse childhood experiences on emotional and educational development. We know that such impacts, if not quickly addressed, can have lifelong detrimental effects on a young person. For this reason, a range of measures are contained in the Bill, particularly focused on children, including extending the scope of the current child cruelty offence. The domestic abuse offence can also be aggravated where the victim is under 18, or by reason of involving a relevant child if at any time in the commission of the offence the accused directed or threatened to direct behaviour at the child, or made use of them in directing abusive behaviour. It also applies where the child saw, heard or was present during an incident of abuse. The aggravator will also apply if a reasonable person would consider the abusive behaviour to be likely to adversely affect the child. Having worked closely with the Justice Committee, we have also sought to further protect children through providing powers to introduce an Operation Encompass model. This will allow a designated person at the child's place of education to be informed that there has been a domestic abuse incident impacting on that child or young person, ensuring that schools and colleges are in a better position to understand and be supportive of that young person's needs. As a result of amendments introduced at consideration stage and refined further at further consideration stage, this bill will also provide protection for victims of domestic abuse who need legal representation in family law cases in the courts. Legal aid is an important part of our welfare provisions. Ensuring that access to the law for those with limited access to finance is not unfairly restricted. I am pleased that the provisions that now stand part of the bill have added to and complement the existing legal aid provisions and that that support is delivered in a way which ensures it cannot readily be misused to perpetuate abuse. I am grateful to members of the Justice Committee and in the Assembly generally who worked constructively with me to achieve that aim. The provisions that we have adopted together will also provide a foundation to develop more and stronger protections for victims in the future. And I very much look forward to working with the Justice Committee and with stakeholders to make the best possible use of the opportunity which this provides. A range of other provisions reflecting the work of the Committee have also been included to improve the Bill. This includes more detailed provision on training, reporting and independent oversight of the new offence, as well as associated guidance. We know from the experiences elsewhere that whilst legislation is hugely important, the effectiveness with which it is operationalised is dependent on training and awareness of the new legislation and how it can be applied. I am grateful to our justice partners who are already looking at how this legislation and the training for their respective organisations can ensure that the Bill really delivers meaningful change for victims. The Bill also now provides for protective measures for victims, allowing domestic abuse notices and orders to be brought forward through secondary legislation if required. Those notices will provide a further and important safeguard for those subjected to abuse and, again, I look forward to updating the Committee and working with them on progress to deliver them as swiftly as possible. The legislation also prevents perpetrators of domestic abuse directly cross-examining their victims in both criminal and family proceedings and ensures that special measures are available to them. It will further enhance the protection available to victims, giving evidence in other civil proceedings. Collectively, these provisions will give greater protection to victims in court proceedings across the criminal and civil jurisdictions. Mr Speaker, I hope that we can secure royal assent by March and, along with our criminal justice partners, bring the offence into operation before the end of the year and sooner if possible, subject to the completion of the training and awareness raising to which I have previously referred. 
This is now being considered by our core statutory partners, and a multi-agency task and finish group is looking at how best awareness raising can be progressed between now and the offence coming into operation later this year. A multimedia public advertising campaign will be crucial in terms of raising awareness around what constitutes domestic abuse behaviours and that they could be captured by this new offence. I hope that it will also help encourage the public to recognise that while domestic abuse may be committed behind closed doors, it is not a private matter. We need not only victims of abuse, but also those who are aware or suspicious that abuse is taking place to be able to see and recognise the signs and feel confident in reporting their concerns. Mr Speaker, a lot of hard work has gone to br into bringing us this, to this point, and I, along with my officials, want to pay tribute to everyone who has helped us to reach this stage. This was done on behalf of and for all those that are affected by domestic abuse. I thank my predecessors, David Ford, who consulted on this new offence, and Claire Sugden, who made drafting the bill a priority during her time in office. I would also like to put on record my sincere thanks to the Justice Committee and in particular to the Chair and Vice Chair for their stewardship of the Committee's detailed scrutiny of and comprehensive report on the bill. I also want to thank the Committee's officials for the work that they do, including behind the scenes, to make the Committee stage run smoothly. I am also very grateful to the Bill Clark and her team for the support to the committee, as well as the invaluable guidance and direction to my officials as legislation progressed. Huge thanks are also due to our statutory and voluntary sector partners, and in particular to victims of domestic abuse themselves, whose input and continued work has shaped this legislation, both at its inception and as it passed through the House. And I look forward to working with them over the coming months to operationalise it. Mr Speaker, I would also like to pay thanks to the Office of Legislative Council for their work in crafting such a detailed and comprehensive piece of legislation. Along with the Departmental Solicitor's Office, I thank them for their efforts in responding to a number of challenging drafting demands, particularly as we move rapidly through consideration and further consideration stage of the Bill. Again, this has served to ensure this Bill is as robust as possible. It is no exaggeration to say that we are only at this stage as a direct result of their expertise and contribution in assisting me as sponsor of the bill and my officials. And Mr Speaker, whilst it is not convention to name officials in the chamber, I do want to pay a very special tribute to Dr Veronica Holland and to her team in the Department of Justice for their work on this legislation. Veronica has led on this legislation since its inception and she has shown, I think, that she is willing to go way above and beyond the call of duty. And that team have displayed a commitment to the delivery not only of this legislation, but of protection and support for victims, which for me exemplifies public service at its best. I am hugely indebted to her and to the wider DOJ team for their passion for this issue, their empathy with the plight of victims and their unwavering commitment to deliver a robust, effective bill that will positively impact on the lives of those living with abuse. Mr Speaker, in moving to conclude my remarks, I believe this is a significant piece of legislation which will help thousands of people, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, age, race, religion or disability, right across Northern Ireland, who are experiencing domestic abuse and fear in their own homes. Abusers are wielding power over their victims because it is not currently an offence to do so. This bill is our chance to change this by criminalising abusive behaviour, sending out a clear message that it will not be tolerated and that perpetrators will be punished. But it also marks an important step in not only encouraging more people to talk to someone about domestic abuse, but in changing the conversation. Mr Speaker, there can and must be no shame in being a victim of domestic abuse. It can happen to anyone and is not a result of the actions or inactions of those who are abused. The only shame lies with the abuser, with the bully, with the controller, who never wants their victim to have the courage to talk about what is happening to them or to reach out for help. Completion of this legislation will play a crucial part 
in giving victims the courage they need to report and seek help. Courage to know that they are not in the wrong, have nothing to be ashamed of, and importantly, will be believed. Courage to know they will be supported. Courage to know that the justice system works and that it has their back. On that basis, Mr Speaker, I commend the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill to the House. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I call the Chair of the Justice Committee, Mr Paul Given. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. So here we have it, members, the final stage of the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill. And when we started on this legislative journey, this finished product uh, was not as weighty and substantive as it now is when we reach the final stage. Testimony to the work of this Assembly, to Assembly members, uh, in producing a comprehensive piece of legislation uh, that I believe will provide greater support uh, to victims of abuse. And that is at the heart of what members considered throughout this process. How best do we provide that support? Do I believe that this will er eradicate uh, domestic abuse and solve all of the problems in our family courts? No, I don't. But I do believe it will provide much greater support. It will provide a better justice system and it will give confidence to victims of abuse to take that vitally important step and reaching out in the first instance. And then they have a much more responsive system in place. I hope it also sends a message to the perpetrator that when it comes to coercive control, this new offence of psychological abuse, financial abuse and the many other myriad forms that it takes, the law can now prosecute you for this. I hope that will deter them from carrying out then this kind of heinous crime in the first instance. So, members, we're here now at the final stage. And on behalf of the Committee of Justice, I want to welcome uh, this stage of proceedings. I say during the first debate on the bill at the second stage that home is the place where most people feel safe and secure. It is a haven where you can relax with your loved ones. Yet for many people, women, men, young and old, home becomes the worst place to be. It is a prison and a living nightmare, and the crime is committed by someone that supposedly loves them and that they should be able to trust. The most recent uh, PSNI statistics on domestic abuse crimes and the fact that cases involving domestic abuse generally account for nearly 20% of the public prosecution service caseload each year is an indication of the prevalence of this crime. We have also seen an increase in calls to the police service during the COVID-19 pandemic and the resultant lockdowns. These figures are staggering and unacceptable and clearly illustrate the need for this legislation which is long overdue. Domestic abuse can affect anyone regardless of gender, age, class or sexual orientation and it can never be excused or tolerated. It is absolutely right that this legislation will provide the necessary tools for the justice statutory agencies to tackle domestic violence and abuse, take into account patterns of such behaviour over time and bring the perpetrators to justice. The bill has undergone extensive and detailed scrutiny and debate, both during committee stage and during the lengthy debates at consideration stage and further consideration stages, and that, Principal Deputy Speaker, is a good thing. This Assembly is here to make legislation on behalf of the people of Northern Ireland, and it is vitally important that we spend time and effort to ensure any legislation is as good as it can be. As a result, of the scrutiny, a large number of amendments were made and a range of new provisions added which have improved and strengthened the legislation. Psychological abuse in the form of coercive and controlling behaviour can be just as pernicious as physical violence, and the committee heard at first hand from victims the devastating impact that coercive and controlling behaviour has and how it can continue to affect their lives even after they have found the strength to leave such a relationship. Victims say that the impact of physical abuse can be much greater and longer lasting, and there is usually a slow transition with victims only realising afterwards that the abnormal has become normalised to the extent that they do not recognise it as abusive behaviour. The controlling behaviour leads to a lack of self-worth, a loss of identity, and a dependency on the perpetrator that they exploit with impunity. The new domestic abuse offence now criminalises this behaviour, captures domestic abuse 
in its myriad forms enhances the protection and access to justice provided to victims by the criminal justice system in Northern Ireland and will enable the police service and the PPS to make more effective action in terms of prosecuting perpetrators. The legislation will also provide an opportunity to raise awareness of the existence and unacceptability of psychological abuse and coercive control, and in the longer term, assist in changing societal attitudes towards domestic violence and abuse. While concerns were raised about the inclusion of a defence on grounds of reasonableness, it does provide the necessary balance and safeguards given the scope of the new offence and the wide personal connection provided for in the legislation. Domestic abuse can also have a devastating impact on the children involved, and the experience shows that such behaviour can be replicated across generations if the cycle is not broken. The provision of aggravators in relation to a child in the legislation is therefore particularly welcome. The amendments brought forward in relation to these provisions also provides better clarity that non-physical ill-treatment of a child by someone with parental responsibility for them is an offence and ensures that such matters as isolation and humiliation is captured. The solution that was necessary in relation to 16 and 17 year olds is, however, suboptimal, and as the committee highlighted, work is required going forward with the Department of Health to ensure there is better alignment across the board in these areas. One of the key issues raised with the committee in written and oral evidence and directly by victims of domestic abuse was how abusers use the legal system and the court process to continue the abuse even after they have left the relationship and are trying to build a new life for themselves. It is therefore essential to ensure that victims of domestic abuse are not re-abused during either the criminal or civil justice process. The original provisions in the Bill that provide for automatic eligibility for consideration of special measures for the protection of witnesses in domestic abuse criminal proceedings and prevent uh, cross-examination uh, cross of witnesses by persons accused of domestic abuse in criminal proceedings and in family proceedings have been enhanced by including provision for special measures in family and civil proceedings and the prohibition of cross-examination in person in civil proceedings. The Department have brought forward these amendments as a result of the evidence received by the Committee from key stakeholders and victims of domestic abuse, and the Committee supported them. They should, all, uh, they should assist and support victims to give their best evidence, whether it is a criminal case or a family or civil matter. The civil legal aid provisions now in the Bill also seek to mitigate against abuse of a financial nature by perpetrators in relation to Article 8 proceedings. And while these amendments were brought forward by Ms Rachel Woods and not the Justice Committee, once supported by the Assembly, the Committee did devote as much time as it could in the limited window of opportunity between consideration and further consideration stage to facilitate discussions between members and the Department and Minister to ensure that there was a clear understanding of the intention behind them, and the Committee formed the view that a commencement clause for these provisions should be included in the Bill. Despite tabling two separate amendments, the Minister was unable to support the Committee's position, and ultimately, they were not included in the Bill. The Minister has, however, given an undertaking both at Committee and on the floor of this Assembly that she intends to commence the legal aid provisions at the same time as the offences provided that they prove not to be repercussive. The Department was seeking legal advice and beginning the process of undertaking due diligence before Christmas, and the Committee looks forward to receiving an update on progress in relation to this issue in the near future. Turning just to the six committee-led amendments that became part of the bill following support of the Assembly, and which in my view greatly enhances the legislation, two of the provisions provide additional support and protection for both adult and child victims of domestic violence and abuse. Clause 27 places a duty on the Minister to provide for domestic abuse protection notices and orders, or a similar type scheme within uh, 24 months of commencement of this legislation to give short-term protection to victims for a period of time after an incident, giving them time and space to consider their next steps. While this was opposed by the Minister on the grounds that she intends to bring forward such provision at the amending stage of the Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, the Committee very much appreciated the support of the Assembly in making such provision in this legislation. There is now certainty that such a scheme will be introduced in Northern Ireland within a specific period of time. Clause 26 provides for schools to be notified where a domestic abuse incident has occurred the night before in which police have been called out. And this approach has been adopted very successfully in England and Wales, enabling schools to be in a better position to understand and be supportive of a child's needs 
and possible behaviours and helping to safeguard children against the short, medium and long-term effects of domestic abuse. The tenacity of the committee and its members has ensured the legislative basis for this scheme is available now. One of the consistent themes running through the evidence the committee received related to the importance of ensuring the legislation once passed is implemented properly and effectively. Many organisations and individuals expressed the view that the legislation would only be as good as its practical implementation and that how the legislation is implemented is as important as what it covers. The committee supported that position, believing that for the legislation and in particular the new domestic abuse offence to be effective uh, and achieve the desired result of better protection and criminal justice outcomes for victims of domestic violence and abuse, getting the implementation right in terms of training for those involved in gathering evidence, prosecuting and enforcing the new law and monitoring and reporting on it is crucial. The provisions brought forward by the committee and now form part of the bill relating to robust data collection, regular mandatory training for all police service, public prosecution service and courts and tribunal service staff who are involved in taking these cases forward and regularly reporting on the implementation of the new offence, including independent oversight, should enhance transparency and provide reassurance regarding the full and effective implementation of the legislation. The committee also welcomes the fact that the Minister took on board its views regarding what was Clause 25 and is now Clause 30 and brought forward the amendment sought by the committee and subsequently supported by the Assembly to ensure the Department must provide guidance on the new domestic abuse offence rather than may provide guidance. The provision of guidance is a vital component in both the training of the criminal justice agencies to ensure a common understanding of how the new offence should be applied and, and to assist in the consistent and robust implementation of the legislation. Given its importance, the committee requested the amendment so that there would be no room for doubt regarding the provision of guidance. Before I finish, I just want to highlight that a wide range of other issues relating to the provision of support and assistance to domestic abuse uh, victims and the need for progress in these areas in conjunction with the legislation has been repeatedly brought to the attention of the committee. While this legislation is significant and there is no doubt that we will now be in a much better position to tackle this heinous crime, it will not solve all the issues relating to domestic abuse and any effective response will also require adequately resourced support to facilitate a victim's exit from a relationship and maintain their safety together with preventative measures such as education programmes, and the committee will continue to make this a priority. So, Mr. Speaker, there is uh, no doubt that the committee considered all aspects of the bill, the range of proposed amendments and the other issues that were brought to our attention in a full and thorough manner, and at times it has proved challenging. I want to thank the committee members for their diligence and the time and effort that they gave to scrutinise the process. I will not repeat previous uh, commentary when it came to consideration stage where the committee invested a huge amount of effort, but I too pay tribute again to members for the way in which they uh, scrutinised this legislation. For some members, they are first time dealing with a legislative process and they equipped themselves uh, in an excellent manner and uh, discharged their duties in a way that I believe we can all be uh, proud. I want to thank our own committee staff. I want to name in particular Christine Dara for the work that she does in supporting uh, the committee members and the work that she carries out with all of the staff uh, within uh, the Justice Committee. I want to thank the Assembly staff, um, I want to thank the Speaker's Office, the, uh, Bill Clark for the advice that was given to members. Uh, at times it may not have been advice that we wanted to hear because we wanted to do more things, uh, but we had to be kept on the straight and narrow when it came to what we can and cannot do, uh, but I do want to thank them for the professionalism uh, in how they conducted themselves. I also again want to place on record the appreciation of the committee to all the organisations, too many to start singling out individuals for fear of losing out some, um, and so I do not intend to do that, but I do want to thank all of the organisations uh, for uh, the way in which they engaged uh, with the committee, uh, for their contributions to our scrutiny, taking the time to provide written and oral evidence, particularly though the victims of domestic abuse who shared their personal experiences despite the difficulties in reliving such experiences. I know for members it was difficult, as the minister outlined uh, when she has heard from pe people, as members of the committee heard directly, it was difficult to listen to. 
But how much more difficult was it for those people to relive uh, such horrendous experiences that they have had to go through? Their contributions were invaluable to the committee. I also want to thank the Minister um, and the Department for bringing this legislation through the Assembly and for the work and commitment that has brought us uh, to this stage today. This did start its journey right from David Ford's time and then Claire Sugden's, and I agree with what the Minister said. Uh, this should have been in 2018. And never again should these institutions be brought down. Never again is there a justification for these institutions to be brought down when such important work was being taken through the Assembly at that stage. I want to thank, um, as the Minister uh, name-checked her official, but direct, uh, Dr Veronica Holland, who had to uh, be engaged by the committee for many hours of scrutiny, uh, put through the ringer in terms of the evidence and the testing of that evidence basis. Uh, it's not an easy job. Um, having to engage with committees during a scrutiny process, but uh, Dr Holland carried that out uh, professionally uh, with all the due courtesy and respect uh, that uh, uh, officials would give to this place, and uh, Dr Holland certainly embodied all of that, and so I join with the Minister in paying tribute uh, to her for that. Taking uh, the approach to come through this Assembly, rather than using the Westminster Domestic Abuse Bill, as was originally considered has allowed organisations and victims to help shape the legislation, and I hope they see the value of this. Our legislative process will also be completed ahead of the Westminster Bill, which is currently at the House of Lords Committee stage. So, On behalf of the Committee for Justice, I am delighted to support the final stage of the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill, and I commend it to the House. Thank you. I call the Deputy Chair of the Committee, Ms Linda Dillon. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I would like to attach myself to much of the commentary made by, by the Chair, particularly in relation to our thanks to the Minister and her officials in the Department and our own Committee and our Committee staff, and in particular Christine, but all of our Committee staff that, that worked really, really hard even over the summer months. And to prepare the report, so it, it really is very much appreciated. And today is a good day for victims and a bad day for perpetrators, we hope. But there are many victims out there who are not having good days, and that's what this is about, and we need to deliver for those people. The Chair has pointed to the work of the Assembly and, and as I say, the various departments on the committee, and I want to point to the hard work of the victims and survivors of domestic abuse in terms of their given personal testimony to the committee members and all of the stuff that they've done in the background and the campaigning, as the Minister has already outlined, that they have been doing for many, many years. Many of those working in organisations who support those victims of domestic abuse were, were victims of domestic abuse themselves and they then see their role as supporting others. So, when we, when we look at organisations, very, very often, while it's not always, very often a, a large number of those people have come from a background of, of being an abused person themselves. When the Assembly returned last January, it was made clear by all that new domestic abuse legislation was an absolute priority. And I'm grateful to the Minister that she brought the legislation forward so early. And I'm grateful for all the work carried out by everyone involved. But I suppose, just to be frank about it, we don't need congratulating for doing our jobs. It is our job to put legislation through this House. That's what we're here to do. And I'm glad that this legislation was something that I was part of and that I was able to, I hope, bring something to. And I certainly didn't, and I'm sure the other committee members and the Minister and her staff felt the same, the weight of the importance of what we were doing and that we get it right. And I do think we did our very, very best to get it right. But there will undoubtedly be things that will have to be improved upon, and we will all work to ensure that is done. I want to commend the victims who, as I say, have worked tirelessly for a long time campaigning on this issue. Their courage should be applauded, and we today send a message that the abuse that they have suffered at the hands of their abusers will not be tolerated. To the abusers, I want to send a message. It's a simple one. Stop. 
The law no longer protects you. You must end your abuse. You will be caught, you will be arrested, and you will be prosecuted. And your abuse must stop now. I'd like to thank the many, many organisations and agencies who played a key role in the development of this bill by submitting written submissions, engaging directly both with the committee and MLAs individually, by giving presentations to the committee, by sharing research and evidence, and by amplifying the voices of victims, and by being a constant source of help and assistance to us all. And I know that the Chair and the Minister did not name any of the organisations for fear of leaving some out, and we will. But I do think that some organisations who have really engaged very closely with all of us should be named. And as such, I would like to thank the Women's Aid Federation, the Women's Policy Group, the Men's Advisory Project, La Dolce Vida, NSPCC, the Bar and the Safeguarding Board, and also Here NA and Cara Friend and the Rainbow Project. And most importantly, as I have already outlined, the victims themselves, those who courageously told us about the horrors of their abuse and what they had experienced. And the committee chair is right. It was very, very difficult to listen to, so we can't even imagine what it was like for those who had to give that testimony and what it was like to have to live through it. And we will never, hopefully, be able to understand that. But you can be sure, and I said this during one of the debates, there are people in this building who do know. There are victims and there are perpetrators in this building. The figures that the Chair outlined are testimony to that. If 20 per cent, one in five, this, vict this, this building and, and everybody in here is not exempt from that. So we need to be looking around us, we need to be looking after those around us, and we need to be given some leadership on this issue. The new domestic abuse offence marks a step change in how society views domestic abuse. It makes it clear that domestic abuse is not restricted just to physical violence, but that course of control is equally as devastating and intolerable in its impact. The new offence covers behaviour that is abusive because it is controlling or coercive or amounts to psychological, emotional or financial abuse. This behaviour is used to harm, punish or frighten their victim. It is designed to make a person dependent by isolating them from support, depriving them of independence and regulating their everyday behaviour. Members will no doubt be aware of my particular interest in Operation Encompass, and it is something that I and my party have been raising and hammering home the importance of since we first heard of its existence, and it was the safeguarding board that raised that with me when I was on the policing board. Operation Encompass is an inf information sharing mechanism which allows PSNA personnel to communicate with a designated person within the school or educational setting to inform them of any domestic abuse incidents which involved a pupil. This will help to safeguard children against the lasting effects of domestic abuse by facilitating the provision of rapid support within the school or educational environment by providing a secure and sympathetic environment to the child. Some practical examples of this could be the provision of hot meals where the child may not have eaten, supporting rather than scolding a child who may not have completed homework and emotional or psychological support for a child who will be clearly vulnerable. I now look forward to seeing the rollout of that with the PSNA and the Education Department, and I am greatly welcome the fact that the Education Minister has already piloted a scheme in relation to this. I don't think we can overemphasise the importance of this. Whilst it may seem a very small thing, it will be a massive thing in a child's life. And I think it also is informative to staff within schools that it it's, makes them constantly be thinking whenever a child comes through the school gates or through the, the gates of any educational setting of what has that child been through, what are they going through at home and what is my responsibility to emotionally support them and to look after them when they're here. As a former member of the policing board, I'm well aware of the vital role that the PSNA will play in the implementation of this legislation and has already been outlined by both the Minister and the Chair, and, and we have outlined in previous debates 
the importance of the implementation again. This bill is not worth the paper it's written on unless the implementation is right and unless we fully understand and the PSNI fully understand their role and all of the justice agencies understand their role and un fully understand what this um, a bill is about and those that it serves. It is easy to, to spot physical violence and it leaves marks, it leaves bruises, cuts and scars. Much of the abuse will form part of the new domestic abuse offence will be more subtle and more difficult to spot. And that is why this training will be so, so vitally and very important. Police officers who are responsible for gathering and collecting evidence along with prosecutors and the judiciary must have a clear and thorough understanding of the behaviours associated with non-physical abuse. Effective and regular training will therefore be one of the most crucial aspects of this bill as we ensure the PSNI, prosecutors and judiciary are supported in their efforts and equipped with the proper tools to tackle domestic abuse. The bill also includes the provision for enhanced protective measures for victims of domestic abuse by enabling the Department of Justice to make regulations for steps to be taken or measures to be imposed for protecting a person from domestic abuse. We now know that the Justice Minister intends to legislate for these, and I welcome that. DOJ are currently consulting on these proposals for introduction of domestic abuse protection notices and orders, and we, will, we are currently examining these proposals and will be preparing a party response. But it is important that everybody who has an interest in this response to this, and particularly those who will be most impacted. The, pr the present protective measures that are available to victims are not good enough, and often difficult or costly for victims to access. Nonetheless, between 2016 and 2019, more than 16,000 applications for non-molestation orders or occupancy orders were made to the courts. That just gives us some idea of the scale of this. In relation to legal aid, I am glad that we have now gotten to a point where the bill includes provision for expanding the eligibility criteria for civil legal aid for victims of domestic abuse. And I do not intend to rehearse the many arguments that have been rehearsed in the previous stages of the bill, but I would, would like to highlight that this could turn out to be a very, very important step for victims. And I would like to thank um, my colleague on the Justice Committee, Rachel Woods, for bringing forward the amendments in relation to this issue. Whilst there still remains a huge amount of confusion around whether or not Clause 28 may be repercussive in effect and therefore whether the Minister will be in a position to commence this clause or not, Clause 29 now puts a duty on DOJ to bring forward new proposals within two years to reduce the financial burden on victims of having to go through court proceedings with their abusers. And I know there is still a huge amount of work to be done in this area, in which we will all play a role, certainly us in the Committee. And I think I can speak for most members in the Chamber when I say we are all keen to carry out this role and to ensure that we can have the best possible protections in place as quickly as possible. And it is important that we get this right. I have already outlined the important next steps in terms of training up those staff in the policing and justice system and in getting the legislation commenced and implemented. However, there still remains an awful lot of work to be done to tackle the issue of domestic abuse. And as was outlined by the, the Minister, domestic abuse is a societal problem and it can't be tackled by the just, justice system alone. And as we know in all of these things, prevention is always better than cure. We don't want to have to use this law. It is there for those who get to that point, but we want to protect people from becoming victims in the first place. There is a huge role for the education system in building an effective curriculum for teaching children about healthy relationships. And I would urge the Education Minister to look at a model of uniformity across our schools, because currently could we I are ask, reliant. Can I ask the member to resume her seat? I am loath to interrupt the member on what is an extremely important issue and one that she clearly cares very strongly about. But unfortunately, question time is scheduled to commence at 2 p.m. Um, so this, we will return to this item of business after question time and the urgent oral question from Mr John Stewart, when the member will then be invited to conclude her remarks. If I could ask the House just to take its ease for a moment until there is a change at the top table. Thank you.
Okay, members, um, and we'll return now to the final stage of the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill and continue with uh, Ms Linda Dinn. Fuutsa Tashi and Ms Linda. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as I was saying b before question time, there is a huge role for the education system in building an effective curriculum, and, and I had asked and urged that the Education Minister create uniformity across our school and, and educational state in relation to this issue because currently we are relying on school principals and, and boards of governors to decide on what type of information is disseminated to their pupils around healthy relationships and, and what kind of, you know, I suppose, support in relation to that issue. And I think it does need to be more uniform because, as I stated before we, we broke for question time, it's so important to prevent people from becoming victims in the first place and to hopefully prevent people from becoming perpetrators in the first place also because we know that some of these perpetrators, it, has the, it is a cycle that has come from within their own homes and their own families. And we need to break the cycle. And we need to break the cycle to give them better opportunities and outcomes in their lives also. So for me, I think that's really what we need to be focusing on. And I certainly, as a mother of a, of a 12-year-old girl, would think that it is extremely important that whilst I will teach her within her home, that she also learns within her school and among her peers what a healthy relationship looks like and what it looks like from, from both sides of that relationship. So key to this, um, there's also a huge role for workplaces and employers in putting in place effective workplace policies which can support victims in the workplace and increasing awareness in the workplace. And as I highlighted earlier as well, that includes within this workplace, within the place within which we all work. And key to this again, as we have discussed during the, the committee process and during previous debates, is the urgent need for statutory entitlement to paid special leave for victims of domestic abuse. The economy minister must act urgently to do the work that is needed to get this on the statute book. And if it's not a priority for her, I would encourage her to make a priority. I know that our committee colleague, Rachel Woods, is bringing forward a private member's bill in relation to this, and I would encourage the Minister to adopt this approach, just as the Minister in the 26 counties decided to move on the back of a bill that was being brought forward by my party leader, Mary Lou Macdonald and Louise O'Reilly. And the Minister moved on that, and that's very welcome, and I would really, really appreciate if the Minister for the Economy here would do likewise. So there is also a need to reform the system around housing points, and I welcome that Carol Lee Cullen, when she was standing in for Deirdre Hargey, confirmed that the Department for Communities it will be, as a, on the back of the review in relation to housing points, will be bringing forward a policy around ensuring that intimidation points will be awarded in, for domestic violence. Currently, as it stands, you will get intimidation points if, you, if it is proven that it's sectarian abuse or homophob homophobic abuse, but not where you're the victim of domestic abuse. And this is really important that, that points will be awarded in, in relation to this. So I welcome both Karen Lee Cullen and Deirdre Hargey bringing forward this in, in, through their Department for Communities. There are important issues within the justice system, however, that aren't included in this bill. And th we all know that there's a severe lack of rape crisis centres in the north to offer specialised counselling, advocacy and support to women, men, girls and boys who have experienced sexual violence. There is an urgent need for the provision of streamlined domestic and sexual violence advocacy service that caters to the needs of all victims. And There is a need for consistent and sufficient funding and resourcing to support services and organisations. I am going to finish on this. When I spoke a few weeks ago, before we actually did the further consideration stage of the bill, to Sonia McMullen of Women's Aid, she said that women who had engaged with the committee and the department felt ownership of this bill. They felt that they were part of it. They felt they were part of creating this bill. And for me, that's what this is all about. It's so important that they feel that they were part of this, that they feel it will deliver for them. And I know that we haven't got everything in here that everybody would have liked to see. 
But we're not at the end of the road, we're at the beginning of it. And I can give a commitment on behalf of myself and my party that we will ensure that we continue to work on this issue in every department and right across this assembly and the executive. And I know that my colleagues on the committee also gave similar type of commitments throughout the previous debates and within the committee. So I hope we will all work together because this is not just about creating a bill and having legislation on the books in terms of punishment. We need to do the work that prevents people from becoming victims in the first place. We need to put in place the supports. We need to put in place all of the prevention measures that we can. And we need to seriously do this and look at the resources that is needed and required to do so and support anything that comes forward around that resourcing. Thank you and thank you to the Minister for bringing this forward and to everybody across this House for the very important um, contributions that they've made throughout all of the work that we've done and throughout the previous debates. Gormila Mayogov. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, firstly, as the SDLP spokesperson on justice, I genuinely and warmly welcome this final stage of the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill. And I want to thank the Chair and the Deputy Chair of the Justice Committee, who have preceded me with their speeches and have covered much of the detail that needed covered here today, and particularly the Deputy Chair, who had the courage of listing those people who we needed to thank, and they were many. And I particularly do single out those individuals who brought their personal testaments to us, and they very much are in the heart and the shape of the bill that's in front of us. The, the, I suppose the origins of the bill, in terms of my own party, my SDLP colleagues who have been in this House before, lobbied hard along with stakeholders um, across a, a plethora of, of ministers, Minister Ford, who committed in his tenure to taking this on, and I thank also then Minister Sugden, who followed up on, on carrying that um, work forward, and today the Min Minister Long for seeing through on that work and bringing us to this stage here today. Particularly, it has to be noted, amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, when everything has been challenged, including the pace of work in this place. And the Minister very rightly referred to that period of absence, in which time uh, many of the stories we heard um, may have related to a period of time where the, the assistance wasn't there and the help wasn't there. And that is something that should not be repeated in this House. It is a significant and a very important day because today is the, the process where we actually criminalise that very dark and twisted behaviour that we learned about um, in detail during our deliberations of not just domestic abuse, but that coercive control that has been very hard to pin down. The perpetrators of those behaviours choose to act that way, and today they should be hearing a very clear message from this House that if you choose to continue with that type of behaviour, you are creating a criminal offence, and consequently you could be imprisoned. The clock's ticking and your time is up. Equally, I would hope that the victims of domestic violence listen today and are empowered by listening to the voices in this chamber and outside it and are empowered to reach out and find the confidence to speak up and look for help. There has to be help for those people and if there's even a seed of doubt that a relationship that you might be in is not a healthy one, seek help. Have a conversation with somebody who could just act as the leveller to say, are your suspicions right or perhaps you can identify the seeds of what could become coercive control, because it is a very escalating um, piece by, by its very nature. While the legislation today, today does speak largely about delivering justice for those who have become victims of domestic abuse, it also very importantly gives reference to the education piece that the um, Deputy Chair did speak of, through education. Through education, we can explain to people what a healthy relationship looks like. We can put the markers down for what, what is wrong in a relationship and what not to expect, despite the cycle of abuse that people may have, been, um, have, have had to live with. The bill is needed, 
And while the bill, as presented here today, has much strong content within it, it is unfortunate that there are things that are not there. And one of the things members won't be surprised to hear me say was even though it may be on a temporary basis, the need for the removal of the plans on commencement of the legal aid, because this is the piece that we heard repeatedly from victims. During deliberations, the Justice Committee heard and really understood the barriers to justice that exist for many victims. And in particular, it spoke to those victims who were repeatedly dragged through the courts. These are victims who have found the courage and are trying to rebuild their lives. And yet, the legal system as it stands at the moment fails them because they are financially broken if the perpetrator, who simply will not go away, insists on dragging them through the courts. So there is a shadow for me today in that, that hovers over this bill, and I do accept that the Minister has given her personal commitment to, to come good on that part of the, the bill as soon as, and I hope is, identified that there will not be repercussive cost or effect. And I, and I hope that that is the final chapter on that issue. To follow up on all of the detail that we have included in this bill, and it is vast, and I will not be going over it, members will be pleased to know, but it is ultimately true to say that the strength of this bill will be in it being properly resourced in all its parts. And it is only then that the key operational issues that have been raised through those um, interactions with victims and survivors, through proper resourcing, that we can hope to reach out and help those people properly. Support for victims must continue to be injected in this bill and through all the agencies who support them. And I have to say, many of the uh, voluntary stakeholders who we engaged with on many occasions raised with us, the level of resource that they are trying to work with is increasingly difficult. And that is sad to say that through COVID-19, the numbers reported have increased and the, their resource has been stretched even further. So we must not just thank them, but we must take seriously the work that they do to help all those victims of domestic abuse, and we must support them. I want to thank again um, the Justice Committee officials who really did work tirelessly with the committee throughout the bill and the bill's office who really showed an abundance of commitment um, to the bill and as others have already broken with protocol and quite correctly so in my opinion to mention Dr Holland, I too am going to single out um, one person for particular mention, not just because of the commitment she showed but the often antisocial hours of help and support she offered me during this bill and that is Stephanie Mallon um, who I have to say was as committed to the bill as everybody in this, in this chamber. Um, departmental officials who, who have appeared at committee, including Dr Holland, and when requested, showed a very open ear, it must be said, on their approach to the development of ideas with the committee throughout the bill. The joint committee effort in this regard also has to be commended at this, on this occasion. I also would like to thank the Office of the Speaker and the entire Assembly staff uh, who facilitated the progress of this bill by clocking up quite uh, marathon sessions, I think it has to be said, in this chamber, sometimes ending in the very small hours. And that includes all those staff, the doorkeepers and everybody who facilitated us being here. But my final thanks have, has to go to those stakeholders and individuals who presented the facts, often the very ugly facts and truths to us and behind the offence that we are trying and have attempted to frame here. And it has to be noted that their commitment in the depths of their despair to helping others is truly humbling to watch. And I, and I want to place on record my thanks to them. While the headline today no doubt will focus on the deliverance of the bill, and quite rightly, um, I would say that a voice must be given to those, to those who, who formed it and brought it to us. 
It is important, I think, on every occasion we have surrounding um, any opportunity where we're speaking on domestic abuse and coercive behaviour, I think it is always an opportunity for us to make known to those people who may be living under such circumstances that help is there. And that is true today, as it was yesterday, and hopefully will even be more stronger tomorrow. So if you are living under those circumstances, if you feel uncomfortable, if you somehow feel oppressed, or you're living your life on eggshells, or you can't quite put your finger on it, just stop and think. Seek the help. Have the conversation with those around you. Help is there and people are willing um, to listen to you and, and listen to your fears. Domestic violence, and it must be noted, is not always physical. And coercive control in particular is so difficult to pin down, but it has an escalating effect. A very minor uh, attitude to something one day can grow into something that is completely unhealthy and beyond any bounds. So if you are living in an unhealthy relationship, assault, threats, humiliation and intimidation or any other abuse that is used to harm or punish or frighten you, there is help. As Women's Aid state, and I'll put this as my final and closing remarks, Mr Speaker, Women's Aid state, making domestic abuse or coercive control a criminal event is a huge step in tackling domestic abuse. But now we must all play our part in making people understand what it is. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Doug Beattie. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, today's Blue Monday, apparently the most depressing day uh, of the year. Um, but I have to say, if we have to lift ourselves up with anything, it's the progress of this bill uh, and drawing it uh, to an end. Um, you know, or maybe not an end, maybe a beginning, but drawing the process of creating the bill um, to an end. Um, it's been a long process, um, started long before the present Justice uh, Minister was in, in place. But since we have come back in January last year, it's actually been a very speedy uh, process, and we really have put our shoulders to the wheel uh, in regards to this, because this is a complex bill, uh, and for, even for those who have followed it, that is the members of the, the committee and, and the members of the Justice Department and o others, it's been really hard to follow uh, at times, and I have learnt so much from this. So it's right to thank the Justice Minister and all her staff for the work they've done in, in bringing this forward. And it's right to thank the Chair and the Deputy Chair for their diligence in the scrutiny. And it's right to thank all of the members of the committee for the effort that they put in to this bill. Uh, and there was blood, sweat and tears from that committee uh, in creating where we are today. People really did take ownership of this. People were moved to make sure it, it was the right piece of legislation because domestic abuse is insidious. It is intergenerational. It affects individuals and it affects families and it affects our society and we need this strong legislation that people can use it and that they can stop the harm that is being caused by domestic abuse and coercive control. Of course, there are some issues within the bill that even after we've done this and, and we've put it out and we're trying to get it operating and resourced correctly, that some people will say, well, you, you missed this. Uh, and of course, there will always be concerns. There are concerns um, that there was no domestic abuse commissioner. I accept that. I absolutely accept that, that people wanted a domestic abuse commissioner. Uh, personally, myself and my party, we would rather have a Victims uh, of Crime Commissioner, and I, and I hope the, the Minister is taking that point forward, and she did say that she would do. Uh, but I can understand there are people out there, and we need to understand that, that they will feel that they got the lesser uh, of what they actually wanted. The legal aid issue uh, is another really complex issue, and I'm not going to go uh, into that at, at, in any length. People have raised it, and no doubt they will raise it again. Um, but I am very clear of the commitment that the Justice Minister uh, has given. Uh, she has given that commitment in here on a number of occasions, and it is up to the 
um, the Assembly to hold her to account on that commitment she made. And I don't think she would have it any other way than we held her to account. Uh, and the last point I would say, which was a concern for myself, was the issue about uh, parental alienation. I really did want parental alienation on the face of the bill, um, but it wasn't. Um, but very early on in discussions with departmental um, solicitors uh, and subject matter experts, they explained to us exactly how this bill would ensure that parental alienation could be domestic uh, abuse. Um, so I was happy, but I would have liked to have seen it on the face of the bill. But this bill is robust in its nature. It is robust, particularly in regards to coercive control. The bill makes sure that people get trained. And that's really important, that those people who have to deal with those people who are suffering from domestic abuse, be that the person being abused, or be that the family members who are feeling the effect of that abuse through the abused person, that those dealing with it are trained properly, not just to identify the sights and signs, but how to deal with the individual. I think that's a good um, add-on to this legislation. Uh, and the information sharing. Uh, and and, I, and I, I relayed, I think, uh, as Mr Frew's story uh, about a child going to school. Previously, I won't do it again, but I think the fact is that we have somebody in a school who we can pass information to if a family is being abused is absolutely core to this for our children. I think it's incredibly uh, important. Um, uh, and and, I, and uh, you know, I thank all members for making sure uh, that is in. Um, I, I'm not going to, to talk and I'm not going to go into uh, detail. I'm being very uh, generic in regards to this, but I, I want to make one plea uh, at the very end, if I can, and that is this. Men must feel that this legislation is for you also. Because for all too often, men don't see that. Yes, we know that there are far more women who are domestically abused or are likely to be domestically abused, but there are men out there who are being abused. And they need to know that this is their legislation uh, as well, that they need to lean into it, they need to use it, they can use it to support them, and they need to understand that the people out there know exactly what they are going through and that they will help them. So that is my plea to men to make sure you realise this is your legislation also. Uh, I will finish when, by saying that, that, of course, we will be supporting uh, this legislation, uh, and I look forward to when it's up and running uh, fully, uh, because the legislation will speak for itself, and no words that come from me standing in this chamber in isolation um, will, will, will match what those who are being abused are going through uh, on a day-to-day -day basis but the legislation will speak to them. The legislation will give them support. It's the reason why we've got it. So the legislation speaks for itself. We don't need to put too many words to it now. It needs to get on and do what it's designed to do. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I call John Blair. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And as I begin, I wish on behalf of Alliance to express my genuine regret to the victims of domestic violence for whom this bill has come too late due to a legacy of three lost years with no functioning assembly. And for those people, uh, hopefully we can all of us resolve to do our best to ensure that such lapses do not occur again in the future. I, I want to start uh, addressing the content of the bill, uh, Deputy Speaker, by thanking the Justice Minister for bringing the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill before the Assembly. The Minister, during her first year in office, has paid particular attention to the issue of domestic abuse. She should be commended for her determination and congratulated for following through on her pledge to endeavour to deliver on this bill. The bill creates new domestic abuse legislation in Northern Ireland and addresses the incredibly destructive practice of coercive control. It ensures that protection of vulnerable people is not limited to those who have endured physical or violent attacks or both. The Minister has taken most serious note of issues raised in this chamber and elsewhere in relation to coercive control and its effect on those we represent. 
Turning, Deputy Speaker, to, to policing matters, and as I do, I should declare my membership of the Police and Board for Northern Ireland, which oversees the activities of the Police Service of, of Northern Ireland. Um, I wish to reflect on, on the current potential and the real risk for domestic abuse in today's unique public health circumstances. Stay at home is at the core of our COVID-19 response, but it has left some people in a position where they are forced to spend much more time at home with their abuser. Domestic violence and abuse is at a 15-year high in Northern Ireland, with more than 32,000 incidents reported to the PSNI from June 2019 to July 2020. In Northern Ireland, a domestic abuse call is made to the PSNI on average every 17 minutes, according to reported figures. The Bill Deputy Speaker, also provides provisions in training, and training is undoubtedly fundamental for the operationalisation of this offence, training which will hopefully be bespoke to circumstances affecting women, men, those in same-sex partnerships and other personal and family circumstances where abuse could occur. It is a, pos a positive thing that a variety of specialist partners with vast experience of dealing with the aftermath of domestic abuse can work with justice partners now, better enabled through this legislation to work with and work for survivors. The completion of the legislation will provide better protection for survivors of domestic abuse and provide confidence in knowing that they are supported. I join in the thanks that has been expressed to the Justice Committee, the Justice Committee officials, uh, departmental officials and other Assembly officials for work they have done in bringing forward this bill. Deputy Speaker, with Alliance colleagues, I am happy to support the bill. Thank you. I call Paul Frew. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, and I rise to support this stage and this bill going forward here today. Uh, it is good news for the victims uh, of domestic abuse and coercive control. Uh, and I would agree with the Minister. I don't know if I've been able to say that uh, going through these various stages, but I do agree with the Minister regarding the delay. Because as she has rightly said, the Minister has said, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that Whilst politics wasn't working in this place, violence was being meted out to victims on a constant daily basis. And it is not acceptable at all, but it's not acceptable that we were not allowed to at least try to remedy that violence and that crime. But we're here now, and it, it, is, it is a shame because Surely this year shows us all the work that this Assembly can do and the work, more importantly, I would suggest, the work that our committees do. And whilst it is true, as the Minister states, that politics didn't work for three years, every single politician in this room was working away. We are working away making a difference to hundreds of families a week, a difference to their lives in a positive way. What we are being prevented from doing is the work that achieves legislation, the work that builds relationships between MLAs and our committees. And we're a far poorer place because of that. Because one thing I've learned, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I've come back into this arena, is that I don't necessarily value the debates in this place. I do very much value the passing of the legislation in all its various stages, and I will defend that to the hilt. But more so than that, it's the work that we do in our committees, the building up of relationships between members of rival parties. It is also the building up of a capacity and a knowledge that you can only get by reading a committee pack on a weekly basis. We were deprived of that in those three years. We were deprived of that knowledge, that expertise, and that capacity to build up. When it comes to passing bills like this, it is that capacity that is so important. It's that knowledge that is so important in order that we make sure we get the right legislation to affect change in a positive way to our people, all of our people, no matter where you go to worship or whether you go to get schooling, it's all of our people who benefit from legislative change, and that's something that I will defend. And there is no good reason, no reason whatsoever, 
why this place cannot function. Sometimes it won't function well. We all know that and see it. But sometimes this place functions very well. And that has to be continued. The only way it can be continued is if the, all the parties give it life in order that politicians like myself and others can actually do the work in this place, in our committees, in this chamber, to bring back real effective change to our people's lives. I can go out in a constituency wise uh, guise and help a family, 100 families a week. But if I want to make positive widespread change, I have to do it in here. And I have to do it by these blue bills. That's how I do it. And we were provide, uh, deprived of that for too long, far too long. But we were working. And not only were we working, but the support groups around domestic and sexual violence were working also. And they're working even harder because we weren't, be, we weren't able to support them. And of course, all party working groups continued and can continue to do their work even when this place wasn't functioning. And I give, I commend all of those, and I give thanks to all of those groups who worked through the lean years, never giving up, keeping on pushing, kept on prodding, and made sure and helped to produce and shape this bill that we have in front of us, this document that will change people's lives in a positive way. For the first time, Mr Deputy Speaker, we tried, and we've tried, to capture coercive control into legislation. No mean feat. A really hard task, which we were able to, which we hopefully will be able to achieve now. And there was a lot of brainstorming and a lot of gnashing of teeth throughout the way. But I think we've got to the best possible position with this paper. There were a number of naysayers at the very start, not at the very start of this legislative journey, but of the, at the very start, whenever we started to talk about coercive control and how we could ever capture it in a bill, and there was a lot of people thought it couldn't be, couldn't be completed, it couldn't be done. And the proof will be in the eating. The proof will be in the actual practical outworking of this bill. We've produced a bill, nothing more. We have produced legislation albeit very positive and good, great achievement. But it's the practical outworking of this legislation that will make the difference to people's lives. And so I do think it is incredibly important that we keep an eye on this law. And that's why it's very important that we have training involved on the, on the, in the bill and also reporting in the bill. I think that's vitally important going forward because some legislators, some jurisdictions, have had more than one go at this. And it might be the case that we need more than one go. We remain to be seen. It remains to be seen. And we hope we don't, but we may well do. So all of that is very important to get into the bill. And I'm glad that the committee was able to work through these issues together, collectively. It's not, very co it's not often the case, Mr Deputy Speaker, that you get to a point where you can move committee amendments. Sometimes you see a raft of amendments coming from individual members who may sit on a committee, but it isn't all that common to get a raft of committee amendments, and that is a credit to the members and the staff on that committee for working through, compromising seeing what can work, what could work, and then bringing it forward to, uh, in amendment form, which is very good. There, are, there were a couple of battle zones within this bill, a couple of issues, and one that came to the front, of course, was the legal aid aspect. And I thought what the member was trying to achieve, Ms. Rachel Woods, was a very suitable and honourable compromise with regards to the waiver. Taking on a mighty subject piece by piece, and I think that uh, credit has to be given uh, and credit is due to taking that on and actually trying to do some, some positive change in what is a monster issue. And I think what that did was opened up a, big, a bigger battlefront that this bill could never contain. 
uh, an envelope, but one I think that we will pick up from here on and run with, because there has to be change in this regard. There must be change in this regard. We can see only too clearly by the people that we have spoken to, both support groups and victims, that this cannot continue. The whole aspect of legal aid can't continue, but the way it manifests itself into the victims' lives has to be resolved. It has to be. And somehow we're going to have to grapple with that issue. So I'm glad that we've got the report on the legal aid aspect uh, in there, because I think that will be vital work that the minister will be able to push on with. And again, I'll be there supporting it uh, every step of the way. Uh, some of the issues I would like to have seen in the bill, but again, I, I go back to my earlier comments with regards to the, for the first time we have actually encapsulated it in a bill, coercive control. So I understand why I couldn't bring aspects like non-fatal strangulation, like the rough sex defence and tackle that, and then also parent alienisation, as my colleague Doug Beatty has, has also spoken on. And I realise that in, in this bill, wet it through this bill, thread it through this bill, is, is, is those aspects. But again, the proof will be in the practical outworking of this legislation to see how that manifests itself, to see how we can protect people against those, as, those specific aspects of what I believe domestic violence and sexual violence and coercive control. Uh, so I will await to see how this rolls out. And again, that's why it's very important why we need someone to have an oversight in the implementation of this law and also that there would be frequent reporting of the rollout of this law because I think that will inform us better than anything into what we need to do next, what next step we must take to ensure that we protect people and not only protect people, victims, but also to try and eradicate this massively evil, evil pursuit and activity. It, it, when, you think, when you delve into this subject, when you see what people have been through, my goodness, it, it, it's, it's chilling. It really is chilling. When you speak to some of the victims and what they've been going through for years, what their family have been going through, what their parents have been going through, what their children have been going through, it's so scary, so scary. And I only dip into that world with scrutinizing this legislation. I don't live it. Dear help anyone and everyone who does. And if we can make a small part, small difference, positive difference to their lives, make things easier, give them the strength and confidence to move forward, well then surely it's all been worth it. It's all been worth it and they can seek and they can ascertain hope out of this bill and out of the agreements that we have reached, the compromises that we have come to in order to, to achieve this bill, the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill. But again, I emphasise it will be an implementation because the last thing we would want to do is for anybody to forgo any of these clauses within this bill, any of the law enforcement agencies, any of the court procedures and organisations that run that, that they would forgo any of the clauses in this bill to the point where law was ignored or just not implemented correctly. That would be a travesty. That would be letting down the victims of domestic uh, abuse. Uh, and, and that cannot be comprehended. And that cannot uh, go ahead. So we need to carefully consider the implementation of this bill, the reporting, uh, the ascertaining of the effectiveness of it, that all has to come along. We all have to be informed. And then we have to look at our next steps. What do we do around non-fatal strangulation, rough sex defence and parent alienisation, legal aid? How do we grapple with those issues? How do we get the, out to the other side in a positive way? That's all for the future. All for the future. And I hope that we get the opportunity it might not be in this term, and it might be with a new suite of people on the Justice Committee, and it may well be a new suite of people in this House. But this is the marker down now. This is where we step off from. 
this assembly and this committee and the minister and the department in order to make sure that we make sure there's real change and then the next steps are taken. There's so many people to thank. There's so many people to thank in this process, not least the minister, for her work on this. All the other previous ministers, as the minister has alluded to earlier in her speech, the department itself, and there has been one name bandied about uh, in this meeting, in this plenary session today. I mentioned her earlier on, I think it was at second stage, again, very proactive. Uh, I'll not embarrass her by naming her, but she, we all know who she is, and she has done very well uh, by the department, in the committees, engaged very proactively with the committee and with the all-party working group on a constant basis. And departments will only work effectively and efficiently by the people that populate them. And I must say to the Minister, you definitely have a good one there, the Minister, through you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the committee staff must be commended for the work that they have done over the last number of months. Multiple meetings in a week, every week, for many weeks, and that's no mean feat whenever you're trying to prepare packs. And sometimes it's very quick moving. Uh, so there was a lot of care and attention taken over the last, probably since September and right through the, the summer recess, to be fair, since we've started this process at committee stage. So again, committees will only work effectively by the staff that populates them and the members and the goodwill of the members within them. And I must say, I'm not just saying that because I sit on it. The Justice Committee is one I really enjoy, and I've built up relationships with all the members on that committee to a very high standard of, of productivity and, and respect. And, and I respect all the members on that committee because we really, I think we, we work well together as a team. And that's the real politics that we should be endeavouring to produce. Uh, also, the, the Assembly staff and the plenary staff and, of course, the speakers who have been through this. I was told off a number of times at various stages of this bill, that's run of the mill for me. I wouldn't want it any other way, to be fair. Uh, so, Because it's all about robustness, about debate, and about making sure that this bill is forged in fire, both in this place and in the committee. So again, that's just, to me, robust debate and the way it should be. Because at the end of the day, we have to think of the victims in all of this, not, not, not us. Not, not uh, or, or, or standing or, or pride in any given subject matter. It's about the victims out there. I'd also commend all of the support groups, too many to mention, I know some have tried, too many to mention and the personnel within them, who have worked night and day. I can remember getting text messages at half two in the morning from people, uh, commending aspects of speeches and, and movement of amendments. Uh, and for some people, even this week, even last week, people in those groups have told me that this has been a, an emotional roller coaster for them because they see the damage done on a daily basis. And then they also see, on the other side of that, the positive good that could be done with legislation. And they've waited so long. They've waited, craved so long for this legislation. And now it's nearly within their grasp. But most of all, we have to thank the victims who have had the courage to step up and speak to us, speak to a committee with, with what that means for them, the officialdom of a committee, and then maybe to speak to the department and the minister herself. That takes courage. For someone who doesn't know this environment, for someone who doesn't know how a committee works, for a victim of domestic violence to, to approach and come forward with information, information that's grievous to their, 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 even to their soul, and having to recite that to members who they've never met before is enormous, absolutely enormous. But they did that. They completed that. And I hope that those people who put that effort in, courageous effort in, will see fruit at the end of all of this and will, will be able to, to get some peace uh, from, and some measure of happiness from this bill, some measure of safety even, from this bill. So again, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank everyone in that process, and I'm, great, I'm greatly joyed by the fact that this may well be the first bill out the other side of this journey, and so be it, because we've been waiting so long for it, with all the, what, what I've said earlier, and let's, let's 
look forward to the practical implementation of this law, and let's make sure that victims are at the centre of that. Thank you very much. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. This bill, soon to be act, is probably, and I would argue, the most important piece of legislation that his House has ever enacted for the people of Northern Ireland. It impacts everybody in our society. And on the 28th of April this year, or last year, we welcomed the introduction of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, now the Civil Proceedings Bill, and today I thoroughly welcome its final stage. It was a privilege to have worked on this legislation as a member of the Justice Committee and also a privilege that this is the first proper legislative process I have engaged with. There has been a tireless campaign for years for criminalising coercive control and domestic abuse, for it to be taken seriously as not something that is simply referred to in an off-the-cuff comment as a domestic, something that is confined to behind closed doors, or something that is laughed off or dismissed as less serious than it is something that was not the business of society, the police or the criminal justice system. It absolutely is. I must, like others, pay tribute to a number of groups and individuals involved in getting this legislation to where it is today, which is in no way exhaustive at all, and apologies at the outset for leaving anybody out. But to name a few, Sonia and all of the CEOs at Women's Aid uh, Federation Northern Ireland, Deronda at MAPME, Victim Support, WRDA, here and I, Rainbow and Car Friend, the Bar Library, PPS, PSNI, those in the Scottish system who assisted me and my team, all of the children's organisations, the APG as well, and of course Claire Sogden MLA for her work on this as previous Justice Minister. And I also want to thank the committee members, the clerk and committee staff, the assembly staff who are also here to have to in the mornings on occasion, and all those in the department, and of course Minister Long for bringing this forward in this mandate, but also specifically Mr Deputy Speaker to the bill clerk Stephanie Mallon. Like Sinead has said, worked with the committee and the members, but of course with me and my team, and I cannot promise her that I will be emailing her any less this year. In particular, I applaud the courage of the individuals who shared their own personal experience in suffering domestic abuse to assist in our consideration, as well as those who have reached out to me personally to share their story, some of whose experiences have been heard on the floor of this House. Their stories are harrowing and have and will reduce the toughest of readers to tears. And theirs is the reality that we are dealing with here. That is the whole point of this legislation. This bill is needed for so many reasons, as we know, but crucially for the protection of victims of domestic abuse. And recent PSNI figures from November 2020 that Mr Given referred to earlier on show that between October 2019 and September 2020, 18,885 domestic abuse crimes were recorded. In the same period, just over 32,000 incidents were reported, both showing increases on the same period the year before. And whilst it's easy to quote numbers, percentage increases and statistics, this is not acceptable, and even more so as it's only the tip of the iceberg. It is only the incidents that have been reported. Many do not get to that stage, but behind each number is a person. That fact is something that we must address and keep at the forefront of our minds as we enact this legislation and in all future policies. The need for this to be in place in Northern Ireland is clearer now for many than it has been in light of the COVID pandemic. The restrictions that were brought in and continue to be brought in by government here and worldwide to deal with COVID has without a doubt increased domestic tensions in households throughout Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK as we were told to stay at home. Home is not always a haven. Staying at home doesn't mean that you're safe. And we've experienced higher incidents of domestic abuse and violence, including homicide, in the last year. And as we know, isolation is a technique used by perpetrators who often seek to exert control by cutting their victims off from the rest of the world to increase their dependency on the perpetrator and to reduce their options to raise the alarm or escape. And I also welcome uh, the Minister's announcement of the new scheme being rolled out across pharmacies, uh, including Boots. 
But I also want to thank those organisations who have stepped up and supported victims throughout this pandemic here in Northern Ireland, who have given a safe place to those who need it, and also note the community response that occurred to support victims, such as She Sells Sanctuary, a non-profit established to raise money for domestic violence charities in Northern Ireland. The pandemic has, however, given rise to increased public awareness of domestic abuse and the importance of a safe home. And it is imperative that there continues to be a collective effort to ensure that there are safeguards in place for many people who need them. So to the specifics of this bill here at final stage, much of what I wish to cover has already been done by other members. And I do believe the bill as it stands now has been worked upon for the better outcomes for victims and survivors. We have a reporting requirement. We have a duty on the face of the bill for criminal justice agencies to train their staff in the new offence, and we have detailed data collection requirements on various departments in order to get a full picture of the rollout of the offence and new legislation. Although I did attempt to get more data points in, such as information on Section 75, I still feel that we need, we need, we need to know more about what we're dealing with. This, in turn, will assist those that are working on the ground with vulnerable and marginalised communities, such as BAME communities. Much more needs to be done to shine the light on the abuse levels within sections of our communities not reported on and appropriate responses put in accordingly. The more information we have, the better. We also need this post-legislative scrutiny not only to gather more data, but also to ensure that the legislation is working. This is a new offence, as others have said, and unlike most that has ever come into law before here, and criminalises behaviour that was previously dismissed as something that just happens. This, as we know, will require a new way of doing things. We need to have more domestic abuse courts, for example. We also have a means by which to establish new protection notices and orders for victims of domestic abuse in Clause 27, and I look forward to the establishment of these in whatever form they take. We have to learn from other jurisdictions on what has worked and what hasn't. Perhaps they're called DAPOs, perhaps emergency borrowing orders, or some other way, but they must provide adequate protection for the victim. Additionally, the perpetrators can be barred from cross-examining victims in court proceedings is entirely welcome. A non-contentious aspect of the bill for the committee and something that we all agreed was incredibly important to have, and I'm glad that this now extends to family and civil courts too. It will be no surprise that I welcome the changes in the financial protections offered to those who are victims of domestic abuse in terms of some changes in accessing legal aid, albeit different to what was first imagined at consideration stage. This was, and I'm sure will remain, a contentious area in justice, but I see this as a first step to wider re reform, one that was much needed. And rest assured, I will not be letting this go for the rest of my time here. There is, however, much more that we would all have liked to see in the bill, but gives us a guide to where the problems lie and where we need to tackle next. We need to look at domestic abuse through an education lens and in the health and social care lens too, not just through criminal justice. This issue goes right back to how we help our young people understand what constitutes a healthy relationship, and we must ensure that future generations can avail of a compulsory relationship and sexual education programme in our schools, for example. Schools must teach children and young people about how to have a safe and healthy relationship, covering all forms of violence, coercion and sexual abuse, including being safe online and offline. And I hope the Minister of Education will be bringing forward substantial resources and training to ensure that this happens for every child and young person in our school system. If we want to give our children the best start in life, which we all do, we must look at the, offense, the effects of domestic abuse on them and ensure that home is a place of safety for children and young people now and in the future. As we know, children are often the hidden victims of domestic abuse and the long-term impact on children includes a detrimental impact on their mental health, their development, their risk of harmful sexual behaviour, future cycles of abuse and potential of youth offending. It was therefore important that the legislation reflects that a child can be aware of domestic abuse in the home, even if they do not see or hear or are present at the moment which it occurs. And I am glad that the amendment put forward by myself and then through my committee colleague, Mr Paul Frew, now stands the face of the bill. I also welcome the inclusion of Operation Encompass and information sharing with the schools. This will be very important for children's wellbeing. However, as I said, there is much more to do. We must deal with the arbitrary distinction in this bill for those who are under and over 16 years old and also the parental responsibility exclusion. We must not criminalise young people. 
and I fully support looking at and introducing much more effective holistic approaches in dealing with abusive behaviour to reduce harm while building on the work that's already in place. We need to examine, really, really examine, why it's seemingly okay for a parent to be abusive towards a child in their home in the form of smacking, for example, and why that doesn't legally constitute abuse. I would argue that it does, and look forward to this coming to the floor of the House sooner rather than later. In 2017, according to OHCHR, Northern Ireland had the joint highest levels of femicide per 100,000 in Europe. And according to PSNI statistics, there were five homicides with a domestic abuse motivation recorded in 2019-20. Of the 29 people killed by their partner or ex-partner, two-thirds were women. 19 women killed by their partner and ex-partner in Northern Ireland up to 2019, most of whom are nameless in the press. And might, whilst they might not be reported on, each statistic is a person whose life has been taken, whose home was not safe and who suffered at the hands of someone she knew. Each one is a family torn apart by their loved one's death. We must do better. Northern Ireland is the only part of the UK not to have a specific strategy to tackle violence against women and girls. Why not? Again, an attempt was made by myself to rectify this gap, but it could not be put into this bill. And I would urge the Minister and the Department to work immediately on this matter and still do question whether, without a strategy, are we meeting the requirements of Istanbul Convention. And I do not believe that this would be at the odds to the strategy that we have in place at the moment, but in addition to tackling, tackling the very real issues of violence against women. Having this act in place will not eradicate domestic abuse, and in order for it to work, proper resources, funding and training must be provided to all relevant organisations in the voluntary sector, statutory agencies, health services, the police and judiciary. And I'm glad some of this is on the face of the bill, but we'll urge again that adequate resources must follow this legislation passing. We need to focus with the criminal justice system through expanding domestic abuse courts pilot and ensuring that justice is sped up through implementing Gillen recommendations and ensuring victims have access to all the support that they require whilst navigating the system. We need a serious commitment to reinvest in refuges and support services for anyone finding themselves in a position to need it, both in the long term as well as support the short term, and I hope the executive can commit to looking at this. It will require an all-executive approach, working with other departments and the pooling of budgets. It is much needed. We cannot have the continued cuts of literally life-saving services that deal with an epidemic of silenced violence on our streets and in our homes. How will resources be allocated in relation to the rollout of this legislation for the police, for social services, the courts, for families, for legal professionals, for services and support, uh, support agencies? Legislation with teeth, alongside properly funded and resourced services is required to protect people. Unfortunately, Mr Beattie uh, mentioned it earlier on, we don't have a domestic abuse commissioner, which I believe is a gap in our law and one which we attempted to close. It is one I will continue to lobby the need for. And I note that Judge Marinan in his review of hate crime in Northern Ireland suggested a joining of the commissioner office between domestic abuse and hate crime. Perhaps this is something that we can investigate further in the future when we address the comprehensive review. Whilst I recognise and welcome that we have independent oversight on the face of the bill, it doesn't go the whole way. And a commissioner could not only be an advocate for the sector, but someone who can ensure adequate levels of funding and training are in place to ensure implementation. The message here that would be introducing a new criminal offence doesn't completely solve the problem, and we mustn't take our eye off the ball. And we need to make sure that the law works in practice. And I believe a commissioner would play a key role in supporting the sector, PSNI and judiciary in doing that. A great number of other issues didn't make it onto the face of the bill, but that were discussed at length by committee. Housing and accommodation, the granting of secure tenancies, uh, which is not specifically addressed in this legislation, nor access to statutory provision for emergency housing. Proper cross-departmental working is required to give the support that is needed for victims. And I would encourage the Minister for Communities to state what her intentions are with regard to housing points, but also the availability of secure housing and accommodation for victims, their families, and if we can expect an increase in supporting people funding going forward.
We could also not deal with victims who have no recourse to public funds, an issue I know was raised loudly in the House of Lords last week on their domestic abuse bill, and I would encourage all those in Westminster to legislate and implement proper protection for these very vulnerable victims. In July 2019, as many, as you, many of you know, New Zealand passed legislation granting victims of domestic violence 10 days paid leave to allow them to leave their partners, find new homes and protect themselves and their children. This was down to a private member's bill by the Green Party MP Jan Logie through the Domestic Violence Victims Protection Act. The only other country in the world to have such legislation at a national level is the Philippines, with some parts of Canada and Europe having paid leave in various forms. Paid leave would support victims and survivors of domestic abuse by giving them the opportunity to seek help, access services and by providing the reassurance that they will not lose out financially or face any disciplinary action for taking much needed time off work. Domestic abuse is a workplace issue and must be considered as such given the impact on the individual, the society and economy. According to the Home Office for the year ending 31st of March 2017, it was estimated that domestic abuse cost £66 billion in England and Wales alone, and this is likely to be an underestimate. Of this, £47 billion was the cost of physical and emotional harm incurred by victims, and £14 billion is the cost to the economy from lost, out lost output due to time off work or reduced productivity. ICTU, in their 2014 research, noted that 80% of the respondents in Northern Ireland who had experienced domestic violence reported that it affected their work performance, and 99% said that they thought domestic violence can have an impact on the lives of employees. Paid leave is no magic bullet, but a significant step in the right direction goes in some way to recognise the links between economic situations a victim might find themselves in. And we had discussed this at committee, but due to the limits of the bill and responsibility for workers and employment sitting with another department, it couldn't go in. But I'm glad, as many of you know, and Linda addressed it earlier on, I have launched a consultation on the introduction of paid leave for victims of domestic abuse, and I would encourage you all to respond accordingly. In conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, we must do all we can to protect people from harm, now and in the future. And the passage of this bill is not the end of the road, it is just the beginning. We have much to do. One in four women in the UK will experience domestic abuse at some point in their lives. One in four. We are in the midst of an epidemic as well as a pandemic. And I said previously, women are being killed in Northern Ireland by their partners or ex-partners, and we need to do much more to protect them. And I must use this time, as others have done, to appeal to anybody if you are going through this or worried about someone who is at risk, please seek help. Please report to the PSNI, the 24-hour helpline for victims of domestic and sexual abuse. Reach out to Women's Aid, to MAPNI, to Rainbow, your GP or social worker. Anyone to start the process of getting away or out of an abusive relationship. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I support this bill final, passing final stage and look forward to becoming an act and being fully implemented for people in Northern Ireland. I call Gordon Dunn. Mr Deputy Speaker, I too welcome the opportunity to speak today on the final stage of the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill. I can guarantee you I will not be as long as, as the previous speaker. There has been a vast amount of work done in getting to this final stage, and this bill has certainly received a significant level of scrutiny. I think we're all very well aware of that, and detailed consideration on it through the Justice Committee. I very much welcome the significant steps forward that have been made on such an important piece of work during 2020 and all the other challenges that we had with the pandemic, and which continues to be with us all. I would like to put on record my thanks to everyone who contributed to this bill, particularly the many victims and the victim support groups who give up their time to present to the Justice Committee on various occasions. These groups work closely with officials whilst continuing to provide the lifeline of support for victims, often on a 24-7 basis. I would also like to acknowledge the work of the Justice Minister and also our committee clerk, Christine Dara, and Stephanie Mann from the Bill's Office, who gave us a lot of uh, good information on a very regular basis. Also, the de departmental officials and the committee chairman, of course, Mr Paul Given, who we cannot forget, who also done a considerable amount of work on this issue. Despite all of the challenges and the range of 
of opinions reflected during the passage of this bill through the committee and the House, I do believe there has been a con common desire right from the Minister and right across this House to further strengthen our domestic abuse legislation. The bill will also better reflect how widespread and how <coughs> appalling this abuse can be, can be right across Northern Ireland. This bill will provide support to victims of domestic abuse and ultimately bring more offenders to justice. The bill also recognises the evolving nature of domestic abuse and I think it rightly recognises that not all domestic abuse is physical and it crucially captures the impact that controlling and coercive behaviour can be as a form of domestic abuse. Since the last consideration stage, I would also like to welcome the Ask for Any scheme, which stands for Action Needed Immediately, just announced by the UK Government last week for victims of domestic abuse for discreetly seeking to get help through pharmacies. This is a very positive example of a practical support measure coming forward. I have written to both the Justice Minister and the Health Minister through questions to see if this scheme could be rolled out further to include all our community pharmacies and other local community services and facilities, such as shopping centres, community resource centres, and even to our other sectors such as close contact services. As has been highlighted throughout the passage of this bill at the various stages, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic with the lockdowns and various restrictions in place has unfortunately we've seen an increase in domestic abuse. This increase has sadly reinforced the fact that home is not always a safe place, as has already been mentioned on a number of occasions for everyone, and the timely need there is for action. On Christmas Day and Boxing Day, for example, just passed a total of 250 domestic abuse calls were made to the PSNI. Indeed, it is alarming that 31,857 domestic abuse incidents, incidents were recorded in 2019-2020, the highest levels recorded since that form of recording began 15 years ago, with a shocking 52% increase in incidents during that time. I think the progression of this bill has significantly increased public awareness, I think we're all agreed on that, around the importance of reporting domestic abuse and will help to give victims a, a voice if they know that support is there and the law can protect them. I very much welcome the progress to date on such an important issue and look forward to the bill receiving royal assent as we seek to go forward to support victims of domestic abuse, so many of whom sadly continue to suffer in silence. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, just to remind everyone, this is the first sitting of 2021 and we're passing legislation to create a new domestic abuse offence. This is largely due to the determination of the Minister, who has made this her priority, and thank you for that, Minister. This long-awaited bill means that domestic abuse offences in Northern Ireland will no longer be limited to physically violent behaviour. It will make a form of bullying known as coercive control an offence in Northern Ireland for the first time. Convictions for the most serious domestic abuse offences will carry a penalty of up to 14 years in jail. This bill includes provisions for the effect that domestic abuse can have on children, with enhanced sentences possible in cases where a victim in a relationship is aged under 18, where a child sees, hears or is present during an incident of abuse, where a child is used to abuse a victim. There is nothing as cruel as having a child used against you or them being coerced into behaving badly against a parent. The so-called parental alienation is something that needed addressed, and I'm glad to say that that has been brought into this bill. As the Minister confirmed in her opening speech earlier today, a previous attempt at this legislation fell when this place collapsed in 2017. And while I recognise the role of the current Minister for Justice in developing and bringing this bill to its final stages, I would like to note the work of previous Justice Ministers Claire Sugden MLA and David Ford, formal, former MLA of this House. The work, of course, of the committee, departmental staff, assembly staff, and all the stakeholder and partner organisations, and especially those brave individuals who have fed into this process. Sadly, in recent times, as we have heard from other speakers today, 
we have seen that this legislation is now more important than ever. The rise in reports of domestic abuse incidents to the police during COVID-19 has been horrendous. There is a lot of information contained in this bill. As others have highlighted, it includes training, reporting and oversight of, new, of the new offence, protective measures for victims, and it prevents perpetrators from cross-examining victims in criminal and family proceedings. This bill will make an impact. It will support victims. I wish no one was a victim of domestic abuse, but until abusers stop, we will have victims and we will need to support them. But this bill should also serve as a clear warning to perpetrators. This House has put in measures to protect victims. Perpetrators will face penalty for physical or emotional cruelty. To anyone who is being abused, you are not alone. This Minister and this House is here to support you. And as the Minister has said, there is no shame in being a victim of domestic abuse. The shame lies with the abuser, the bully. I hope this bill will give heart to victims and help them to have the confidence and courage to know that the system has been improved and will work. And Ms Woods has mentioned there are other departments who have responsibilities when we're considering support for domestic abuse victims. For instance, the Department of Communities are already considering in their review of housing allocations how housing can be made available to those victims. However, Mr Speaker, I am somewhat saddened that the final stage of this bill will fall to a cross-community vote. As someone who is designated as other, my vote and even the vote of the Minister and Ms Woods and Mr Carroll won't be counted in the same way as others. For those of us who aren't unionist or nationalist, I look forward to the day in this House when my vote and my political opinion is no longer treated as something secondary. But even though this process is being, being taken forward today to finalise this bill, that, that that process is disappointing. The bill is not. This is a comprehensive piece of legislation that sends out a clear message that domestic abuse in all its forms, both physical and non-physical, is wrong. This is the final stage. Here is hoping the Royal Assent comes forward as soon as possible. And thank you to everyone who has worked on this. Aram, Sir Jerry Carroll, Hon Kancha. I call Jerry Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, first of all, I want to welcome progress on this bill, obviously, um, because a lot of the measures, some of the measures in it, uh, particularly around access to legal aid uh, for victims, training for staff, uh, keeping records of abuse, will undoubtedly uh, have a positive impact and important impact um, going forward. Uh, I also want to speak, Mr Deputy Speaker, briefly, if I can, about the roots of abuse in society and, and situate this bill uh, in the fight uh, for a better society without abuse in it. Uh, and as has been referred to already, the current uh, weekly average uh, number of domestic abuse calls by the police since the first lockdown was almost 600, uh, 600 calls every week, predominantly from women who are unsafe in their own homes, and that is totally uh, unacceptable. Uh, and it is endemic, uh, and it is both societal and institutional. And I hope that this bill goes some way in, in tackling those problems. Um, and as I say, as I have said previously, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, in this uh, debate in, in the House, I do believe that we need a specific commissioner uh, for domestic abuse and violence and a strategy for women and girls. And it's dis disappointing that this is not uh, in the bill um, as it stands. And I mention women specifically, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because domestic violence is largely uh, gender-based violence affecting women because they are women, and affecting them uh, disproportionately has been referred to uh, in statistics. It has roots uh, in deeply entrenched inequalities and stereotypes about the roles of women in society. And for that reason, uh, we are clear that, uh, unfortunately, uh, one single piece of legislation um, uh, cannot or even a single strategy cannot uh, tackle the problem and root causes of, of these issues. And certainly it is obviously the right thing uh, to legislate uh, for protection of victims and access to uh, um, legal aid and, and other issues. Uh, th th these are vital, obviously, for alleviating the situation facing uh, victims of uh, domestic abuse. Um, but the biggest challenge, Mr Deputy Speaker, to gender-based violence will come from the, the fight against inequalities and oppression in society, which very often um, are not only enshrined by institutions, but often uh, made worse and perpetrated by uh, 
those in these institutions. Much of the gender-based uh, violence we see in society is a breach of consent uh, and the use of power and balances to exert control. Yet the very sex education system, as has been referred to, um, many experts say is vital to the prevention of these kind of uh, sexual crimes, is not really accessible in any real sense for far too many young people in our schools, or if it is accessible, it's not adequate. Uh, and through sex education, we can convey the importance of equality between partners, uh, promote non-stereotyped gender roles, and teach mutual respect and consent. Uh, and I think I've probably passed the threshold of being considered young uh, some, for some time, Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, but it wasn't that long ago I was uh, educated, uh, maybe in inverted commas, uh, around uh, sex education and relationships, and the, the experience was completely inadequate. Um, and unfortunately, far too many peoples are, are still failing uh, to this day. Uh, this bill in front of us um, is to slot into a strategy <clears throat> aimed at reducing. Uh, gender-based violence. We need to see it alongside proper sex education. Uh, indeed, we need to see it alongside proper access to abortion and healthcare uh, issues, including telemedicine. And how often do we need to hear about the impact of restricting access uh, to abortion before we see the minister, the health minister, act on this issue? How many more women will be forced to travel in a deadly uh, pandemic for healthcare? And how many more women will be forced to stay in an abusive uh, relationship because of pregnancies or be forced to carry pregnancies against their will to term because of an abusive uh, partner? How many more women, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, are unable to escape domestic abuse because under universal credit, their abuser holds access to their funds, how many will stay in a refuge because they cannot get access to social housing, uh, we, uh, who cannot rent either because of poverty, and how many, Mr Deputy Speaker, will never get access to a refuge because um, that day uh, they were full to capacity because we don't, as uh, um, I think Ms Dillon referred to, we don't adequately fund emergency uh, services. How many of these women will have children who feel and experience this process? Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, a lack of telemedical abortion, a lack of access to social housing or refuge, to proper and independent access to decent social security, to sex education. These are rights that everyone uh, should have, but that too many go without here in the, in the North. Of course, the problem obviously goes far and beyond those issues that I have referred to and raised today taking in the precarious work of women, the way the state underfunds and underpays for current work that is predominantly taken up by women. All this is to say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we can never look at the issue of domestic abuse uh, or any kind of gender-based violence in isolation, and only when a societal shift is fought for and won will we see the oppressions and inequalities facing women properly challenged. And that shift, unfortunately, will not come solely uh, or within these uh, four walls, um, but it has to be coming from campaigns and movements outside. And until this assembly takes on to do what's right for women, uh, their children, and communities more generally, it will continue to perpetuate the conditions which enable, uh, unfortunately, uh, domestic abuse uh, to uh, continue. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, so I want to, uh, in closing, um, use this opportunity to issue a call to those in charge of health care, of social security. Uh, education, finance, employment, uh, the conditions created by policies under uh, their control uh, are, har are harming women and children and indeed all victims and survivors of domestic abuse. It is not acceptable that their suffering can be alleviated, but instead it is deepened by the actions uh, of these institutions and decisions made or not made. The fight for a better kind of society will happen where it always does, on the streets, in communities and workplaces. And the question for those in power today is whether they want history to say that that fight had to be taken to their door. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I, will, I intend to be brief, and I'm sure I will be. Um, and not for the first time, and possibly not for the last, I will enter a voice of dissent not to the entirety of this bill by any means, but to a specific issue which I have addressed before. It is not because I have any naivety or lack of understanding of how odious domestic abuse is. Indeed, you could not be involved in as many 
prosecutions involving this very subject, as I have been, and not realize just how invasive, insidious, yes, odious, uh, these crimes are. And indeed, I would just say, as a legal practitioner, I can think of few more difficult cases to do and to be asked to do than one involving domestic abuse or child abuse. They are harrowing in every aspect and harrowing too for the legal practitioners. Because as a human being, you sense, you empathise, you feel. So I'm in no way immune from the realisation of just how hideous domestic abuse is. But that understanding of all of that does not diminish something that's very important to me, my respect for the rule of law, my respect for the fact that both in society and within the canons of the law, we must uphold certain standards. As I have previously addressed this House, the second stage, further consideration stage, I fear that in Clause 3 of this bill, this House, this Justice Committee, has taken a very wrong-headed approach, an approach which diminishes the standards and expectations of the criminal law because it totally demolishes fundamentals of what is a criminal offence. We've talked before about the mens rea, the guilty mind, and the actus rea, the production of the product of the crime. And yet, what Clause 3 does is to extract from this criminal fact offence, the actus reus of product, because it's, it incredibly says, to me incredibly says, the House doesn't agree, but this is my view, it incredibly says that an offence of domestic abuse, which is already defined in Clause 2 can be committed whether or not the abuser succeeds in abusing. That the abuser's behaviour can be abusive whether or not it has any of the relevant effects. Provided some notional, reasonable person thinks it should have caused an effect, it should have caused harm, then even though it didn't, even though the reasonable person was wrong, this bill says the offence is complete. The offence is made out. And that jars with me in the manner in which I've previously explained and to me, that is as preposterous as it is unnecessary. I say unnecessary because that situation is already covered by the law that applies to attempts. So the abuser who attempts to abuse, and because of the, how stoic the victim is or whatever, does not succeed, can still, under our law, be guilty of an offence of equal punishment. Because under our legislation, if you attempt a crime, you've got the guilty mind, you try to do it, but you don't succeed, you can be guilty of attempt.
attempting the crime and for it collect the same penalty. In this case, 14 years. So clause three, I repeat, is not adding anything necessary to the criminal calendar because the offence of attempting domestic abuse can equally carry 14 years. And to me, it defends all the senses I have about this matter to say that you can have, create an offence for 14 years where you didn't achieve any of what you set out to do and yet you are treated as if you did. That's my difficulty. I know it's not something that appeals to this House. I know that the committee and this House have a much more flexible view to the sanctity of the criminal law, but I don't want this occasion to pass without again putting that on the record. Thank you. Um, we now move to the Justice Minister, Naomi Long, to conclude the final stage. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, and I want to first of all thank all the members today who have engaged in this debate um, for the final um, reading of this bill. This bill has only been made possible by the diligent and cohesive efforts of a significant number of people, including those many organisations and individuals who gave evidence to the Justice Committee, and many of whom I referred to in my opening remarks. The bill's content has been improved as a result of its passage through the Assembly, and I welcome that. As family courts are the first contact with the justice system for many victims of domestic abuse, I also welcome the provisions in the bill which will enhance the protections available to people when giving evidence in family proceedings and in securing the representation that they need through legal aid. I also welcome the provision in the bill to enhance protection for victims of offences giving evidence in other civil proceedings. This will ensure that appropriate protection is available to all victims in civil courts as well as the criminal courts. Mr Speaker, I want to turn to some of the issues which were raised by the speakers throughout this debate. Linda Dillon and Rachel Woods both raised issues around paid leave because, as people have rightly said, while this bill is a good start, it is by no means the end of the journey. No bill can comprehensively cover every issue. No bill will be perfect, and we cannot allow perfect to become the enemy of the good. And so I think it is better that we have this legislation in place and that we then continue to work on many of the other issues that members have raised. But both Linda Dillon and Rachel Woods raised the issue around paid leave for domestic abuse victims. This is an issue that would fall to the Economy Minister, who has asked her officials to give consideration to the matter alongside a range of other employment-related issues as part of a longer-term vision for employment relations in Northern Ireland. If there is consensus that legislative provision is required, she will identify a suitable legislative vehicle at that time. And indeed, I wrote to the Minister to ask that she take this forward during the passage of this bill. In 2018, guidance was published for employers on developing a workplace policy on domestic and sexual violence and abuse, because it does indeed impact on people's ability to function in the workplace. It was developed in partnership with key stakeholders to provide advice on how employers can develop increased awareness and more effective responses to these issues, and recommends there should be a commitment to a zero-tolerance approach <clears throat> to abuse, reporting procedures and information about the practical and supportive measures which can be accessed by employees. Again, both Linda Dillon and Rachel Woods raised the issue of domestic abuse um, and housing and the difficulties um, that people can experience with housing. As members will be aware, under the current housing selection scheme, victims of domestic abuse are awarded 70 points for homelessness and up to 40 primary social needs points including 20 for violence or threat of violence. This results in up to 110 points. Applicants presenting due to domestic violence do not, however, meet the criteria for the award of intimidation points, 200 points. The Communities Minister is actively considering proposals raised by the fundamental review of allocations. She does not intend to proceed with the proposal to remove intimidation points, but rather wants to consider it from another angle and ensure that they are there for those who most need them. 
She considers it unacceptable that other victims who have suffered trauma or violence, for example, victims of domestic abuse, are not treated with the same priority as those who currently receive intimidation points through, for example, paramilitary coercive control. She is currently working out um, the details of how she will address this going forward. Sinead Bradley um, also raised an issue with respect to funding and whether funds would be made available to the community and voluntary sectors to tackle any increase in cases with the introduction of this new offence. With respect to funding, the vast majority of financial support provided to those organisations in the community and voluntary sector is provided by the Minister for Communities and her department. In many cases, victims of the new offence will already be supported by community and voluntary sector partners because they are already victims of abuse. It is simply not able to be taken through the courts and prosecuted at this time. The offence will also build on cases that could otherwise be in the system which involve physical abuse or sexual violence and again those people will already be receiving support. My department will of course monitor the number of new victims coming forward once the offence is in place and we consider the new offence could see an increase in overall offences of around 3%. We will, impact, we will monitor the impact of that new offence on a range of organisations, both our statutory partners and our voluntary sector partners. And where additional resources are required, that will be a matter which I am confident the executive will seek to meet, because it is a priority for this executive that we tackle these issues together. Turning then to Doug Beattie's comments, um, and I want to, I think, first of all, um, tackle the issues that he raised with respect to the Victims of Crime Commissioner, which I know is his preferred model um, for moving forward. A number of other members spoke about the potential of a domestic abuse commissioner, um, and some spoke of the recommendation in Judge Marinan's report that a domestic abuse and hate crime commissioner could, if you like, become a joint office. Members will um, perhaps not yet be aware, but I have now received the report from and met with the reference group which I established, particularly to look at the issue of establishing a Victims of Crime Commissioner. That um, reference group has set out very clearly in their report a number of different models, um, but also has suggested ways in which we can take this forward. And so I hope to bring forward proposals um, shortly for consultation. Um, and I will be writing to the Justice Committee in due course uh, with details of the planned consultation um, and the approach that I hope to take. Doug also, I think, rightly highlighted that anyone, regardless of gender, sexuality, age, disability, status, race or religious background, can be affected and be a victim of domestic abuse. This bill is blind to all but the needs of victims. And it is worth noting that in 2019-2020, 69% of victims of domestic abuse were female, whilst 30 were male. That is a dramatic change um, from 75% of female victims and 25% male um, in 2004-2005. And I think also you will see in statistics I will give later um, that there has been an increase in very young victims and also older victims. Some of that will be due to people feeling more confident about coming forward to speak about their abuse, with increased um, tackling of the, the taboos around um, male victims of violence. Um, but I think some of it is also a, a realisation um, that male victims of violence is an area that has been overlooked. And I'm going to speak a bit um, later um, in my remarks um, with respect to the gendered nature um, of domestic abuse, because it is a gendered crime. Doug also raised the issue of policy on parental alienation and as he will be aware um, parental alienation and related support services is a matter for the Department of Health. I will of course support policy development where I can. The department is keen to work collaboratively to improve outcomes for children and families and has already been working with the Department of Health on the means of intervening early to help parents avoid the impacts of acrimonious disputes. I understand the Department of Health proposes to explore guidance and training for professionals supporting families experiencing acrimonious disputes and associated negative behaviours as part of the joint work we are doing to improve outcomes for families. I will of course support Minister Swan to scope future actions in any way that I can. Family cases involving significant parental acrimony and alienation are amongst the most difficult to come before the courts. 
where alienation is suspected it is for social workers and those representing the interests of children and ultimately the courts to advise the court which will consider evidence of alienation alongside all other evidence when deciding what is in the best interests of the welfare of the child, which is always the paramount consideration. While the Department of Health has policy responsibility for parental alienation, I am clear that one parent should not be able to use a child to abuse another parent. I consider it appropriate that patterns of this type of behaviour could be deemed to be abusive behaviour and potentially be captured by this domestic abuse offence, depending on the particular circumstances of the case and subject to the reasonable person test. And so I am keen that the domestic abuse guidance relating to the new legislation clearly explains this. My colleague John Blair also raised the issue of the importance of training, as did a number of other members, including the chair of the committee. Police and the PPS recognise that training is critical to this offence's success. A range of statutory and voluntary sector organisations will need to train frontline staff and raise awareness of the offence. So the police and PPS are working with specialist support providers on how best that training can be taken forward. The police will create a training implementation team to ensure the effective and timely introduction of the new offence and uh, it will include representatives from police learning and development team, domestic abuse specialists and victim orientated services. Training will be provided for the PPS and court service staff in order to appropriately deal with cases. With respect to the judiciary, as members will be aware the judiciary are independent and the issue of judicial independence is separate from, as separate from government is sacrosanct. Judicial guidance and training is therefore a matter for the Lord Chief Justice, delivered through the Judicial Studies Board. Discussions are being held with the Judicial Studies Board on this, including considering lessons to be learned from other jurisdictions. The issue of sentencing guidelines will be considered as part of the work being undertaken ahead of the operationalisation of the new offence. Discussions are also being held with the Judicial Studies Board on that matter. With respect to Paul Frew's comments, he raised a number of areas where he again felt that the legislation could have gone further. However, as he will be aware, there are limits. It is already a lengthy bill. It is an incredibly complex piece of legislation. And of course, if we overload that, there could come a point where we are no longer able um, to make the progress that we have been able to make in the time that we have been able to make it. However, there are issues that he has raised which we are making good progress with. The Westminster Government is also intending to bring forward legislation on non-fatal strangulation and so I want to update members, if I may briefly, um, on our plans around this. Following a recommendation by Sajini in 2019, my officials convened a working group and carried out early scoping work on the legislation applying to non-fatal strangulation. I commissioned a full review to identify and address any, inadequacies, uh, any inadequacies in the current legislation and I have tasked my officials to review the current law with a view to consulting on improvements and proposing appropriate legislative change as soon as practicable. And I want to put on record my thanks to Judge Barney McElhome um, from the Derry Court Circuit, who has taken a particular interest in this, along with Women's Aid, and both of whom um, I have had long conversations with um, about this matter. Meetings of the Non-Fatal Strangulation Review Board and Reference Group took place last year, and we're working on developing a consultation paper. With respect to the rough sex, the so-called rough sex defence, it is clear um, in terms of the law in Northern Ireland that no, no person can consent to behaviour which could cause them harm or um, ultimately take their lives. In June 2020, however, a UK government amendment to the Westminster Domestic Abuse Bill sought to outlaw the rough sex defence explicitly to ensure that a person may not consent to being seriously injured or killed in the course of consensual sexual activity. I have determined that the rough sex defence should be included in the review of non-fatal strangulation in legislation. Consultation on this particular item closed last Monday and following analysis of the consultation responses, I will consider the way forward. I have already indicated my intention to prioritise consideration of the rough sex defence with a view to early legislation if appropriate. Rachel Woods um, and Jerry Carroll both raised the impact of education on changing societal attitudes. They will both be aware that this is something of which I am fully supportive. It is not something, however, which I can bring forward as part of this bill, 
but I and my department will work with the Department for Education to ensure that education, and um, particularly sex and relationship education, not only meets the needs of addressing issues around domestic abuse, but also um, that it addresses those issues arising from the Gillen Review of Serious Sexual Offences, and that we educate our young people about respect, about consent, um, and about how to treat a partner and have a healthy relationship. The inadequacy of sex and relationship education in Northern Ireland does a huge disservice to our young people, and I hope that it will change, and change soon. Rachel Woods also raised the issue of the reasonable chastisement defence, and she will know that I wish too to see it removed. Policy lead is the Department of Health, and I wrote to both the Minister for Health and the Education Minister, and I'm keen to progress this as quickly as possible. I have also engaged with those in other jurisdictions who have themselves managed to change the reasonable chastisement defence and remove it from law. It is, of course, necessary that parents are able to discipline their children, but it is not acceptable that people are able to use the reasonable chastisement defence as a cover for abusive behaviour directed towards young children, and I believe that that reasonable chastisement defence should be removed. I will. Given that is the case with the, the Minister, I listened to this debate all, after, all afternoon. As a parent, as someone who believes in the right of a, a parent to bring up the child in accordance with the views of my faith, what assurance would you give to parents like me that those views that I hold dearly and have brought my children up, not always very successful, I have to say, uh, in, in guard, regards to respect and so on, but that it wouldn't be a witch hunt against people of faith who have a very strong held view on this particular issue? With respect to this, I mean, I think that the experience in other jurisdictions shows that if we work with parents and not against them, if we make it clear that this is not about criminalising parents, either those of faith or those of, uh, without faith, um, about how they raise their children, but that this is about giving parents support and encouragement to find other means um, of discipline for their children than those physical means um, that are often used. And I think that the member, in fairness to him, would agree with me that it would be shameful were someone who is physically abusing their child to be able to escape prosecution for that. And we know the difference by hiding behind a reasonable chastisement excuse. And so I believe that for the greater good, it is important that that reasonable chastisement defence is removed, because that is the only way we can break this down. And I suspect that despite what the member has said about his own weaknesses uh, when it comes to raising his own children, I suspect that they too know the difference between abuse and parenting. Um, because I am sure that he raised them in a loving home uh, with a caring environment and that that is what is key. And therefore, I think it is hugely important um, that we protect those vulnerable um, to abuse in our society. And I think the reasonable chastisement defence has run its course. But it is not a witch hunt against parents. It is a way of supporting parents. And that's why it's so important that we look, for example, at the experience in Wales, um, where people started off quite nervous about the removal of the offence. Um, but through working with parents, through working with other organisations that support parents, people came to agree that it was the right way forward um, and made good progress. And the same was true in Scotland. Rachel Woods and Jerry Carroll also raised the issue of violence against women and girls. This is a hugely important issue, um, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is not solely or primarily a matter for the Department of Justice. It is primarily for the Department for Communities and the Executive Office, but I would be fully supportive of them bringing forward such a strategy. Regarding the Istanbul Convention, um, it is not a requirement of the terms of the Convention that we have um, such a strategy. However, that is not an argument for not having a strategy. We shouldn't aim simply to comply with the minimum standards in the Istanbul Convention, but to raise standards and raise the bar in this area. I think it is important, however, Mr Speaker, to disentangle these issues somewhat. It is important that it is addressed separately to the Domestic Abuse Bill, which is designed to support people of all genders, whilst at the same time recognising that domestic abuse is a gendered issue, that the vast majority of victims of domestic abuse are women, and that it is important um, that we have the correct support um, to be able to encourage them to come forward. However, it is also important that we break the stigma 
for those who are non-female, non-binary and non-heterosexual, so that they recognise that this legislation is their legislation too, that they feel empowered to be able to speak up about abuse um, and come forward and seek help. I will, yes. The Minister for taking the intervention. Um, we often talk about the, the fact the statistics around the, the victims or survivors being women. We also need to point out that the perpetrators, for the most part, are men, and that is even where men are the victims. And I think that that is a really important attitude, and I think dealing, um, and I, I don't want to go on a crusade, but I think dealing with some of the toxic masculinity that exists in our society would be a good place to start, not only in terms of tackling sexual violence, um, but tackling domestic abuse and many of the other ills that we face in our society. There is nothing strong or compelling about a man who has to resort to his fists to make his point. And we need as a society to stop um, valuing the strong over the thoughtful and considered. Um, it's not a healthy place to be as a society, and it isn't good, um, either for the men themselves, often who then are racked with mental health problems because they see that as a sign of weakness, um, and who feel that they can't seek support, or who are abused in relationships and don't feel they can come forward. We need to deal with all of those societal issues if we are really going to get to the bottom of this. And I agree uh, with Jerry Carroll on this, um, that I think we have to look at how society is structured if we're going to do that successfully. It isn't simply about one piece of legislation or one action. It is about a course of action that we need to take to change the dynamics within our society, because these are power-based offences. These are abuses of power. These are people who want to control, coerce um, and, and prevent the person from being who they are and living their lives with freedom. That is not what a loving partner or a loving family member does. Someone who truly cares for you wants you to be the best you can be and give you the strength to be that person. And we need to educate, I think, both our young men and young women as to what healthy relationships really look like. I want to thank Kelly Armstrong for her remarks, and I have to say I share her disappointment in the manner in which the vote um, on this bill will be taken, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is regrettable that on an issue which has united this House on all sides in support, irrespective of our position on the constitutional question, that at the point where it passes, it will seek to divide us yet again into tribes. That is evidence for me that the system here is broken and it needs change and reform so that we are all equals in this House. Um, we are all equally counted um, and that all of our votes and our constituents matter. Jim Allister um, said that he was a dissenting voice um, this evening. That's a position with which he is familiar, Mr Speaker, but respect to him because he has come to the House and he has made his point. And whilst I disagree with it, he has made a reasoned and cogent argument. I enjoyed our debate um, in the second reading on the mens rea and the actus reus because I'm a Latin geek as well as all the other geekery that I get involved in. And I understand the point he makes about the guilty mind in the criminal act. But this is not policing a thought crime. This is not someone who is thinking about abusing someone and then doesn't follow through. This is someone who has acted in an abusive manner, but due to the resilience of the victim, the outcome of that has not been to break that person in the way that the, the person intended. So the issue here is about the impact on the victim. And so whilst I have full respect for the point uh, which Jim makes, I can't agree with him that in this case there has been no course of action that would lead to the Criminal Act. For me, it is clear that the Act itself is the, the course of action that leads to the abuse. It's not just thinking about it, it's actually being done. And so it's only the... Yes, I will. Surely the problem is it's a failed course of action. course of action, Mr Speaker. The course of action has been completed successfully. The abuse has taken place. The only failure has been in the ability of the abuser to break the spirit of the victim. Or it could be, as we outlined at the second stage, the fact that the abuse has been so successful that that person is no longer able to recognise with confidence and assurance the person that they were the degree to which they have been denigrated, 
the degree to which they no longer have the capacity to recognise that they are being treated unfairly. We talk a lot these days about gaslighting, but this is a, fa this is a factor of this kind of abuse, where abuse is conducted and the victim becomes so fragile in their own mind and their own spirit that they no longer um, can actually tell whether it is abuse or not abuse, or simply a figment of their imagination, because their abuser has taken such total control of them. In those cases, there is no question in anyone's mind that abuse has happened, except perhaps, except perhaps in the mind of the abused person. Well, if we see that that act has happened, and we know that that act has happened, Surely that proves that we have the actus reus for a criminal prosecution. It is not about prosecuting those who simply think about abuse. It is those who act on it and abuse their partners. I want Mr Speaker to turn to some statistics because a number of members raised the issue of statistics um, during the debate. And I think it is important um, that as we bring this debate to a close, we go back to the issue of the victims and survivors. The PSNI's most recent statistics um, from September 2020 show that during the period from the 1st of October to 2019 to the 30th of September 2020, there were 32,015 domestic abuse incidents reported in Northern Ireland. 32,000. This represents an increase of 128 on the previous 12 months and is the sixth highest 12 month period recorded since the start of data series in 20, uh, 2004 uh, 2005. Furthermore, the police recorded 18,885 domestic abuse crimes during this same period, showing an increase of 9.1% from the previous 12 months and the third highest level since reporting began. This equates to 17 domestic abuse incidents and 10 crimes committed per thousand of the Northern Ireland population. 17 domestic abuse incidents and 10 crimes committed per thousand of the Northern Ireland population. And it is important to note that these are, as Rachel Wood said, only the reported figures. Many more victims are suffering across Northern Ireland but cannot or do not feel able to report it to the police. The domestic abuse crimes made up 19.1% of all police recorded crime during that period, an increase from 16.5% during the previous 12 months. Increases were seen in all major offence types except sexual offences. The largest volume increase in domestic abuse crimes was seen in offences of harassment, which increased by 1,270. That's a 49.8% increase, though there were changes around how this was recorded. I think, however, that highlights how important it is that the Protection from Stalking Bill also had its first stage in the House today, because this is an increasing issue. There was an increase in that period, too, of male victims. During 2019-2020, 69% of all domestic abuse crime victims were female, and 30% were male compared with 75% female and 25% male in 2004-2005. There was an increase in victims in the younger and the older age groups. In 2004-05, three quarters of victims, 75%, were between the ages of 20 and 49. By 2019 and 2020, this had fallen to 64%. Over the same time period, increasing proportions were seen in both the younger and older age groups, but particularly in relation to victims under the age of 15, children suffering domestic abuse. During 2019-20, almost three in five relationships between the domestic abuse victim and offender were categorised as current or ex-spouse, partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife. Just under a quarter were parent-child relationships. And of all offenders dealt with by police during 2018-19 in connection with domestic abuse crimes that resulted in an outcome, 86% were male and 12% were female. The majority of offenders were aged 18. 
and over. Those statistics make grim reading, Mr Speaker. Behind each of those statistics, however, are individuals who are living in fear, for whom home is not a safe place, whose lives have been turned upside down, whose very being is in turmoil because of the the continual abuse and stress under which they are living. And given the numbers, Mr Deputy Speaker, they are our friends. They are our family members. They are our neighbours. They are members of our community. We know them and they know us. And so my final words are for them, Mr Speaker. Do not suffer in silence. Do not feel guilt or shame. Do not be afraid to speak up and to reach out for help. Help is there. You will be heard. You will be believed. You will be supported. There is a better and a safer future for you. Justice can and justice will be done. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Okay, members, um, just before we move on to, to the substance of the legislation, <clears throat> we bit of housekeeping. As the business on the order paper isn't expected to be disposed of by 6pm, in accordance with Standing Order 10.3, I will allow business to continue until 7pm or until the business is completed. Now, uh, before we proceed to the question, as indeed the Minister and uh, Kelly Armstrong referred to, I will advise members that functions of the DPP set out in the Justice NI Act 2002 can only be altered by provision in an Act of the Assembly passed with cross-community support. The imposition of mandatory training requirements by Clause 32 of the Bill will alter the functions of the DPP and, as a result, will require cross-community support. Therefore, the question is that the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill do now pass. All those in favour say aye. 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 Contrary, no. No. Aye. 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 Okay, members, uh, are we still a dissenting voice? Um, Uh, For for the reasons I have accounted for, it's quite clear there's no other support but I'm happy that it's on the record. You're happy it's on the record. Okay. Um, So, members, um, if it's on the record, uh, we're not moving to a vote. Uh, And it's clear. It it is clear that um, there are no dissents. Okay. Eyes from all sides of the House and no dissenting voices. I am satisfied that cross-community support has been demonstrated and the bill is passed. And I congratulate all those who have been involved with this serious and important piece of legislation. Uh, I'm sure there are many people out there who can say a big thank you to you all. Okay. Thank you, members. And members, just take their ease for the next.